Okay, hello everybody. Good morning. Thank you for, for joining us here um, in Sterling and virtually um, in the UK and around the world. I hope you can all hear me okay. Um, I'm David Sinclair from the International Longevity Centre um, and welcome to Sterling. Um, uh, this afternoon we're going to be launching a new ILC report called Retail Therapy, which is all focused on um, how we engage people with um, how we better support people with dementia in the context of, uh, of the high street um, and shopping. Um, and Sterling, an absolutely appropriate place for us to be doing this, given the amazing work that it's done around the place um, in terms of dementia. Um, before we kick off with the first session this morning, where we're going to be talking a bit broader about retail and healthy ageing, I'd just like to invite uh, Leslie Palmer, who is the um, Director of the Dementia Services Development Centre here at the University of Sterling, to welcome us and tell us a bit about the building, if that's all right. Leslie? Thanks, David. Good morning, everyone. Thanks very much for coming along today. Um, I'm the Chief Architect here and the Interim Director, so in my role, I'd like to introduce you to the building. Um, you're sitting in the Iris Murdoch Building, which is the first purpose-built public building to be dementia friendly and it was commissioned in 2002 so a long time ago um, but it's great to have you here um, it's wonderful for you to come to the DSDC we are a centre of knowledge exchange and impact and we work globally to take the research that our colleagues develop within the University of Stirling and act as a proxy to industry to clients to develop that research into tools and resources for everyday citizens so it's really wonderful and a real honour to have ILC here today and we welcome the launch of the report Thank you very much. Great. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. And um, um, so to kick off the, this morning, I'd like to, um, we have a number of speakers. For those of you who um, don't know ILC, we are the specialist think tank on longevity and its impact on society. We're one of 16, so we have 16 ILCs across the world. And we're fundamentally focused on how society, how we support society as to adapt so we can all benefit from, from the extra years we're living. Um, for those of you who don't know us, we were set up in 1997, so this year is our 25th anniversary. And, and you know, for over the last 25 years, we've published about 300 reports and organised about 350 events, so huge amounts of sort of outputs. And But this is the first time at Sterling, so, so it's great to be here. Um, in terms of this session now, I'm going to... We have four speakers and then we're going to have a bit of a QA. and a um, Firstly, we have Professor Lee Sparks, who is a Professor of Retail here at Sterling. Um, uh, Elsa Forbes from the International Longevity Centre. Frankie McKittrick from the University of Sterling. And then George McGuinness, from, who is the Healthy Ageing Challenge Director. Um, there is, um, for those of you joining virtually, a Q&A function in Zoom, so you can put your, your questions in there. And we have set up the live caption, so you can click on the live transcription button um, um, if you'd like to en enable those. Um, let me immediately pass over to Professor Lee Sparks, who is the Deputy Principal um, and Professor of Retail Studies at the University of Sterling, who's going to kick us off with a, a bit of context around sort of the retail environment and, and healthy ageing. So, um, Lee. Whilst we sort out where my slides actually are, um, it's an interesting reflection. Good morning, everyone. The last time I was in this building um, doing a presentation, um, we had a, an evening event with Helen Dickens, who is the chief executive of British Retail Consortium. And Helen's theme and the title of the, the whole evening was Retail Armageddon. And that was five days before COVID hit. Mm -hmm. And so the Armageddon we had in retailing was somewhat different to the one that we were predicting or expecting. Um, as David said, I'm Professor of Retail Studies here at the University and also Deputy Principal at the University. And I want to talk a little bit about retail change some of the work that we've been doing in policy terms for Scottish government around towns and around high streets 
And then I'll pose and try and think about two areas and two questions that do tie into healthy aging. My specialism is retailing as opposed to anything else. Um, and just thinking about the topic and looking, I was just idly um, searching for various things. And I came across this diagram. The UK's best cities for retirement. And it's one of many things you see out there about um, some sort of ranking or scoring. And I'm a great fan of them. Um, I was interested in this one because one of the mid dimensions that was seen to be absolutely critically important was access to a fish and chip shop. <laughs> now, you can judge whether that's what really is on your retirement list or not. Uh, but I think it's interesting. I also noted there's none in Scotland. The themes I want to pursue today, um, I want to talk about the changing environment for retailing. Um, I want to talk about retailing high streets and towns a little bit, uh, then about the aging population. I want to talk about the policy background. I think that's really important um, about the way in which we think about high streets, the way we think about town centres are socially constructed. They're not inevitable and we can change if we need to change or want to change, if we have the will to change. So I want to pursue that a little bit. Then I'm going to pose and try and think about two questions uh, rather more briefly than that may come up more in the Q&A. What role should retailers and retailing be playing? And what does our population need in high streets and in town centres? You gather from the slide which is in Starbucks um, that the photograph um, that I have a sense that we somehow got a shopping retail and place out of kilter. That affects everyone, not just an aging population. I often start with this slide from um, a presentation that Andrew Murphy did a little while ago as the executive director of John Lewis Partnership. And he says there's an existential threat to retail in physical space. And it's something that all of us have to think about and address. And he pointed to three things. There are or were at the start of the pandemic, 51. John Lewis stores. They closed 16 of them during the pandemic. Sales went up by 2%. And 60% of the sales that John Lewis make are now online based. Why do we need physical space in retailing at all? Now, John Lewis may have their strategy right or wrong. That will be found out in particular ways. If you followed Marks and Spencer's a week and a half ago, Thing they're talking about closing 25% of their physical space from their big stores and turning into probably more out of town, simply food type stores. That has real consequences. It has consequences for people, it has consequences for place. And again, you need to think what are we doing? How are we doing? So that's a sort of bit of the background. Changing nature of retailing three things I think that are really important the way retailing has changed over the last couple of decades. The first of those um, is that increasing sense of scale, decentralization, disaggregation, and that dependency on the car, which has driven us in a particular way. Secondly, I'll say something about the internet and the role of the internet in terms of retailing. Then I want to talk about convenience. The photograph is of the west of Glasgow, it's Brayhead and the area around it. It's a few years old now. It's probably a little bit worse than that at the moment. And let's look at that and think about, is that a place? Is that a place people want to be and stay in and dwell in? How do you get there? How do you move around it? It's all about car dependency. It's all about particular types of people, communities, and so on. It's built for the motor car, not for people. So that's writ large across um, our retail sector. Okay. Secondly is the penetration of the internet. This is the internet as a percentage of retail sales going from 2006 through to this month. And we started a percentage of about 6% on that slide. And you will notice a relentless rise of the internet and the Christmas peak becoming a bit more noticeable. 
if you look carefully, you can actually see Black Friday and Christmas as, big as well within that. And then obviously, towards the end here, we have the COVID impact. And there's two points about that. The internet became a default mode of many consumers during COVID, reaching about 38% of sales in the highest month that we had of all retail sales in that month. Um, it also shows the sheer scale of the disruption that the pandemic has had on retail business over the last 24, 36 months or so. See, it's beginning to tail down, but that figure there at the end is still above trend. So there's been some longer lasting effects of that. So we can't get away from the fact that retailing now for many consumers and for virtually all retailers is about an online presence as much as it's about a physical presence. Third area I would talk about thinking the change that we've seen is that about convenience and the localism that's gone on. Local convenience stores and independent convenience stores very much growing before the pandemic, very much boomed as part of the pandemic as well. It's tailed back a bit. But what we see there is growth of that sense of local place, what can be done locally, examples from Scotland here in terms of Scotland, but also how that's tying in to internet retailing, online delivery, local delivery, arising cargo bikes, going back to almost the grocer's boy in many cases, all good. And so we're seeing again that sense of place rebuilding. So it's not just one way, it's putting those two elements together. Um, and that was very much the lessons I would draw in that period from when Helen was here in March 2020 to now, that we've seen much more interest in being local, much more interest in being convenient in different senses, place convenience, time convenience. We see things that are much more about sustainable and community, the bottom of the photographs on the previous slide was about local, shop local, Scottish Government, Scottish Groups of Federation, Scotland Food and Drink Initiative, to drive local produce into those food stores. We've seen online and local delivery grow clearly through internet, but also not just the macro online, but that local focused. How do we shop local stores and have that build that community and delivery as part of that? And I think what really comes out of that is if you get things right, People value that sense of difference, that value of independent variation in businesses, and it helps build identity around people and place. And I think that's really important generally, but I think it's important when you start thinking about older consumers as well. It becomes really important. That was fine. And that sort of story I've been saying for a few years about how that will go where local is important. But we are in a current situation that is changing elements of that and causing all sorts of disruptions within society and economy. The cost of living crisis is well known, whether that's about energy and fuel prices, it has been, but we know. That's the wrong word to say in terms of where we are with this government and interest rates. We think we know what might happen in terms of interest rates. Disposable income decline, we're talking about food banks and they've been, they've been mainstreamed in many ways. And we're now seeing concepts about warm banks because of what might happen in the winter. Um, so the disruption in terms of the economy and people's lives is really quite considerable from this cost of living crisis. The graph is there simply to show what we've lived through in the last decade and then what we've lived through in the last few months. And the predictions from the Bank of England will be, will be living with this bit, the high end of that, for a wee while yet, that being probably well into the end of next year and beyond. So we really have that emergency that's in place, which is affecting all returns. Medium term, and I don't like saying medium term, because I think the climate emergency is really important and really urgent, but 
it is somewhat background at the minute because of where we are in much of this. We need to consider what we're doing about climate, net zero, and the impacts on retail and consumer behavior are. I'll say a little bit more about that in a second. My photograph of Starbucks is one illustration of that in many ways. If you look around any of the retail sector, they're very much worried about operational costs in terms of how they get staff, operational costs in terms of supply as well, how they get product. And that pattern behavior that I showed in the internet slide, you also see that volatility occurring more generally, working from home as an illustration of that travel patterns. That occur. So what you've got is a sector that is really trying to figure out where it is, what it can do, how it can adjust to what is a really complex situation. And the end of that is, I think there's an issue that what consumers want and need, retailers are finding difficult to actually deliver to them. It's becoming much harder to do the basic job of retail. So any things we suggest around how we adjust the retail sector have to factor in that short-term, that medium-term element. So a little bit about town centres and high streets. I'll make a fundamental point to start with, which I really think we do, people do have to address. Town centres and high streets are words that are used interchangeably. They're not the same. I found it really interesting today, and I don't know whether David saw it, that the tweet that came out from ILC, which was reported on in the Herald in Scotland, the headline is about dementia and the high street. The photograph was a bray head. It's not a high street, it certainly isn't a town centre. So we blur these two elements far too much. For me, the high street is that retail core, and primarily retail, in my definition, is retail slightly, the primary core of those town centres. But if we're thinking about place and we're thinking about people, then we need to think about the town centre as a whole, because we're talking about where people live, how people move, how people behave, what the services are, as well as the transactional elements. What's the pocket park that's there for people to sit in, those sorts of things. So we need to be really quite careful about whether we really mean high street or town centre. What we've seen over that period is that decentralisation and disaggregation that's demolished that sense of place. By moving things out, whether it is the offices, the shops, in Stirling, the football ground, sports centre, swimming pool, all have been pulled out of the shop, out of the centre. What have we got left? We've disaggregated space. So why is that? How do we make that an attractive place for people there for to live in? And we also have to reflect that comparative cost of operation. It is more expensive to operate in a town centre or in a high street. Institutionally, fiscally, we drive it to make it cheaper and easier to operate out of town. Whole raft of stuff around that. I'll say one thing about that as well. And then we've got the climate change realities. If we really want to think about where climate change is, place and towns, high streets are more eco friendly, more sustainable than the out of town models that we have. And my point, and I said it right at the start, is that death of the high street, if we're not careful, because that's the narrative you see in the media is very much a self-fulfilling prophecy. We can change it. <clears throat> we also know there's a lot more independent retailers that are opening up across the country. And there's very much a growth from below about what people want. Back to my lessons from COVID. Now, I'm not an expert in this area at all. I say my background is, is retail. My study in the area I study is retailing. And you know more about this than I do. If we think about the aging population, then that relationship purely between age and capability has been dismantled in a variety of ways. Um, those that are 16 and 9, so the most people can see all the stuff that's on like that. We need to think about healthy, healthy aging, we need to think about diet and inequalities. Retailers play a part in that clearly, in terms of how they position things for consumers in particular groups and how they react to those in many ways. That's conditioned also by where people live and how they live and behave. So where they go, how they shop, what they actually purchase. And therefore, what people actually want and need, they almost become subservient to that in many ways. 
the system drives certain behaviors. And businesses sometimes recognize that, but they don't always recognize that. I think there's a, there's a process there that we need to think about, about whether we're going to be more directive around that. It's in steps in that way, or whether we're going to let the market rule and see the consequences of that. In that, um, a little aside, we got given about three years ago, a set of diaries. Um, it was a person's aunt, he donated them to the university, said you might find these interesting to be told them. And his aunt, who was born in 1915, had retired to Yorkshire and had then started a diary. Um, he doesn't believe she wrote a diary before that, so we don't know why they started, it's possible they did. For 21 years or so, she wrote down every shopping trip and every purchase she made. And that's what we've got, it's 21 years of this person going shopping. And it shows that pattern, of purchase and trip. It's from that person who was age 62 to someone who then was about 84, 85. Stopped. And they're interesting for a number of reasons. We've only touched the surface of what we might do with these. But what it shows is this dense network of local shops, bus transport, variety. And over a period of time, that then begins to decline. The variety seeking changes, the ability to access different places changes. Is that because the retail network, it's the 1980s, this is when the superstores really began to grow. Is this because the sector has changed? The bus network, the transport network alters dramatically during that period, as you will recall. Is it because the transport gone, or is it part of an aging process and therefore her needs have changed as well? Some interesting questions around that. The point I'm putting it up there is twofold. The first point I'm putting up is that relationship between what's there a behavior we need to understand in a much greater way than before. And one of the things you'll hear about in a few minutes from Frankie is very much about a modern way of looking at that lived experience and how that actually operates and works and what we can learn from that in common. If anyone's got any ideas on how to analyze this, please let me know because it overwhelms at times. Um, I will say a bit about the Scottish Policy Contest because I know a little bit more of this. We've been working for the Scottish Government on their retail strategy and also the town strategy for a number of years. And I authored the new future for Scotland's town centres a couple of years ago, which was then taken on by the government and by COSLA, the consortium of Scottish local authorities, uh, into the town centre action plan to in Scotland. And it focuses on a number of things. I'll say broadly what the recommendations are in a second. Two things that I think are really important around all of this process. Concept of 20 minute neighbourhoods. Don't care whether it's 20 minutes, don't care whether it's 15 minutes, the principle behind it. But you can live your life, whether it's work, rest, play, any of that, within a 15 minute walk or cycle of where you live. And the idea we need to bring back that density, because that's the livability part. You see it in bigger cities, Paris doing an awful lot of work on it, you see it elsewhere across the globe. How does that translate Scotland cities to Scotland's towns? The idea behind it is all people having that ability to live and work in a more dense network. What does that mean for what we do with our, or our general facilities? What does it mean for retail? Yeah. Second element is the idea of community wealth building. We need to build local resilience. A plaque manager just down the road is one of the pilots in Scotland for community wealth building. But how do we build resilience amongst our community, amongst our businesses? amongst our local supply chains. How do we make things different to what we've got currently? If you're in England, you might know community wealth building as the Preston model. Well, I put the vision up. I'm not going to talk in detail about the recommendations. But the vision that we had was a towns and town centres for the well-being of people, planet and the economy. And that they're for everyone, and everyone has a role to play whatever age, whatever state. Our recommendations are in three areas. Um, as you might gather or suspect, the second of those is the more controversial of the three. That we can do stuff on policy, and we are doing stuff up here on policy that will stop out-of-town development. 
the message of extent. And thirdly, doing some of the approaches, whether it's greening cities, whether it's some of the environmental elements to it, whether it's community assets, we've built a whole raft of things that we are doing. Here. The second one is we should be much more dramatic about stopping supporting activities that cause harm to our places. <laughs> so why is there free car parking out of town centres? Why is there VAT on rebuilding buildings in centres here in the town centre and there isn't any you build out of town? How do we take the fiscal levers so that we actually value what we need to value around climate change, also around behaviour and place identity? I don't think we take that seriously enough, what we're trying to do. So I'll try and draw it to a close with these two areas. So a little bit about this. I get into trouble when I talk to retail businesses because I describe them as social engineers and they hate it. Absolutely hate it. But they are. Where they locate, what they offer, how they market makes them social engineers whether they know it, believe it or not. We only need to think about what we've done in tobacco, what we've done in alcohol, minimum unit pricing up here, of course, and what we've done in terms of um, foods that are high in saturated salts and sugars, some other things. And you know the arguments about nanny state that come against you because of that and all the rest of the stuff that goes with it. But we can engineer the retail environment. We can do it by legislation or we can do it by willingness of retailers when they understand what the opportunities are within that. And that photograph, which is South Africa, is not engineered, it's not legislated. It's the retailer reflecting that actually for groups of consumers, having checkouts that don't have sweets on them is a real benefit. What are the other elements that we can put in the design of retail communities? One of the things that I think Frankie will talk about and others will talk about as well, which we talk a lot about, is that those shops are actually social glue. They tie together communities and locations, particularly the smaller versions of those. How do we get that and get retailers to recognize the role they play, but also reward them a bit for the role they play? Because the ones that don't are getting a free ride at the moment out of town businesses. So my sense is retailers have power and agency, they're just nervous about, about actually exercising both. We need to encourage that. One of the elements I think is important, and I don't have any detail to add much to this, is that I actually think retailers capture a lot of data. They know a lot of stuff. Sometimes that's real data. Sometimes it's inf information they have about people in a broad way. Uh, I think we can use that in different ways. I don't think it should be retailers using it. I think it should be the individuals being empowered to use it rather than the better data to live better. And we can do an awful lot more about that. And retailers, I think, can add value to that in many, in many ways, whether it's what people buy or how often they come in or making sure that people are coming in certain times. They're informing consumers what actually underpin some of those behaviours. So the question under that is, we know that what's happening is that retailers um, are actually now having to adapt to fit our lifestyles. How do we actually empower more consumers to express what they want better to those retailers? How do retailers support choice of people and their choices? And Again, just drawing around, and you recognize this, I wondered about putting this slide up or not. I think the aging population is seen by many businesses from a threat, but I think it's a real opportunity as well. I think that's part of the theme of what David will talk about and the report talks about. Yeah. I think there's some real issues about where retailers should be encouraged to locate and how they should be encouraged to locate there, and how they tie that into home delivery and internet to support certain types of consumers at certain times. There's a lot more to be done around that then the area I don't know much about, but how shops should be redesigned to be more age and health friendly. I think there are far more specialists who know far more about how we could do that. It's getting the retailers to be encouraged to do that. And then you see the concepts of slow shopping on this diagram, which is about five, six years old now, I think, this photograph, it's a Tesco, of a dementia-friendly checkout, and whether that 
is the way to go or not. I have my views, you may well have your views about that as well. Then how do we translate that into town centers? Because we can do design on shops, but how do we design that in place? I go back to our, how we're trying to think about what makes a good 15 minute area, 20 minute area, what can we put in there? The 10 points are from Architectural Design Scotland, if you haven't seen that about caring places, it's worthwhile having a look at. Uh, we often talk in, like Chair Scotland Stamps Partnership, we often talk in that about centres having to be attractive, accessible and active. How do we keep that within a 15 minute period? How do we design that? What are the elements we can do? And I think that's where we need to place the focus and make sure the things that are doing harm to that get stopped. And then um, I thought I'd just do a shameless plug for the article that Judith, myself, and others did. Uh, but we need to involve people within that, that what we're talking about there is multifunction. It's not a high street. I think if we focus on the high street, focusing on the wrong thing, focus on the town centre, focus on things around it, where people live, how they operate through the whole of that place. How do we make that independent into generation? And it has to be bottom up. Every town is different. Every town has different assets, characteristics. How do we build that from the ground up in those ones? Um, I run a blog, um, sterlingretail.com. The presentation for anyone who's interested is up on the blog this morning and some comments about some of the words that I've said. And I ended that final thought. I think it's a bit too easy to focus on the aging nature of the population, let alone and the impacts on poor health. But we need to settle in that wider context that I've said about retail change, medium term, short term, the way that we're doing it. How our systems have structured particular behaviors and then health consequences. And we need to deconstruct that and make sure those elements are aligned properly. Because otherwise I think we really are pushing all that hell. Now we can encourage the economic line but I think we need to change the social place-based line as well. That's me. Um, I'm reasonably active on Twitter. Um, my web and blog is there at sterlingretail.com. Um, really interested in thoughts, comments, and I hope there's something in there for you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, we'll do a Q&A in the, in the later on, but I think there's lots there that I'd really want to come back on, whether that be active travel and, um, and and some of the issues around car parking, which are fascinating in terms of ageing. You know, frankly, actually, there's quite a lot of evidence that actually one of the best ways you get people to do the active travel and physical activity is just charge 20 pence for car parking. It's amazing how much a very small financial incentive makes a big difference. But also issues around nanny state and versus regulations are really fascinating one in this space. And, and indeed, actually, and you, you haven't mentioned it, but I think there's something that I'm keen we push on, push on is actually the role of retailers in terms of their responsibility to keep their own staff healthy. So, so actually, you know, whether that be around night shifts, whether that be around how you think about, um, you know, how you support, re, you know, the staff in the context of and some of our work over that we've just done showed that over the next decade, we're going to be short of um, something like 2.8 million workers just because of demographic change. Now, actually, you know, the retail sector, the care sector are absolutely going to struggle for this. This is twice the size of the NHS. So, so actually, we're going to need to find a way of keeping people, keeping people wanting to work in retail. Um, at that point, I think that's a sort of appropriate point for me to um, introduce my colleague, um, Ailsa, who joined us a few months ago, to, and, and is working with, um, with the support of, of Judith and Sterling, but also George and the, and the Healthy Aging uh, challenge that was to really try and engage retailers in some of these issues around healthy aging. So this is an opportunity for the first, I think, public opportunity for, for uh, and we've done some private events and private activities, but the first public opportunity for us to start to say, this is what we're doing and we want to work with you. So, um, so Elsa, let me pass on to you. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm thank you again, Lee, for that uh, truly illuminating presentation. I found that fascinating, and I have notes on the back of my notes as well. 
So I'm delighted to be at uh, Sturman University to walk you through uh, this short presentation. Um, this is around our 18-month um, project uh, in collaboration with Sterling, with uh, UK Research and Innovation and the Healthy Aging Challenge in transforming retailing for older consumers and across the life course. And who we are, as David mentioned earlier, um, the International Longevity Centre is uh, the UK's specialist think tank on the impact of longevity in society. And we work alongside the International Longevity Centre Global Alliance, which includes um, countries such as Japan, Canada and Australia, with 16 partners around the world. And we want a society where everyone can thrive, regardless of, of age. Uh, and uh, up to a few months ago, I had been a product developer and um, buyer for the heritage and cultural industry, um, working in this, uh, this industry for about 23 years for organisations such as the Victorian Albert Museum, Abbey Road Studios and the Royal Collection Trust. Um, I bought and designed and uh, built a shop and exhibition ranges in this innovative space and I've never met anyone who didn't like a good museum gift shop. Um, so now combining with um, my recent MA, I'm particularly interested in, in, in this space. So I'm gonna start by taking you back to one of my earliest shopping experiences. Uh, and I titled this, when shopping was dot, 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 that could be limited, safe, simple, undynamic, reliable, boring. Um, you can attach many words to that. And this is, this is an image of the vineyards in Great Addo near Chelmsford in Essex. Um, and we've referred to it often as the parade or the precinct. Um, I was shopping here a little bit later than 1965 when this um, picture was taken. It's about 1975 when I was six uh, with my two sisters and my mum. And the vineyards was purpose built in the 1960s, partly to accommodate workers at the Marconi factory in Chelmsford and the English Electrical Valve Company, uh, which was about two miles away. So you had accommodation above, above the shopping precinct uh, and then everything you needed in one space. Um, and I hope, I can't quite remember, but I hope that wasn't just the green space that we had with the very <laughs> attractive 60s rock <laughs> Um And the positives and challenges of, of, of this area. Well, it was uh, referencing um, Lee, 20 minutes, 15 minutes, walking neighborhood access for the whole village. Uh, there are specialist um, shops for different trades. Um, there is still uh, the park and ride into the, into the Chelsea town centre, two miles away, um, buses to the county town every kind of 15 to 20 minutes, uh, and an active parish council involved in the community. But the challenges are that this has unevolved naturally, um, and this is referred to as noughts, which are naturally occurring retirement communities not conceived for the aging in place concept. Um, community infrastructure is aimed uh, at an uh, older demographic and then younger generation leave the village and, and don't return. And I hope the last two slides have illustrated an example of my uh, early retail lived experience and the contemporary landscape now. But our retail world is evolving vastly around us. Um, automation and retail uh, technology are firmly here to stay. Um, you only have to look at examples such as Amazon Fresh with a, compl a practical, complete absence of uh, human interaction. Um, customer service uh, has disappeared in terms of, again, human interaction. Your bank is now on your phone. We are a paperless society. And of course, um, online shopping. Um, finance and retail commerce is changing. So uh, 
limiting cash transactions, automated direct debits, con consolidation of bus passes, train passes, tickets, QR codes, all on one device. Even savvy buskers uh, have a touch and donate mobile payment technology. And shopping, shopping habits are changing. Um, there is a demand for immediacy. We want global groceries. We want out of season herbs, which are grown alongside Kenyan and Ethiopian runways. Um, vintage clothing, which isn't sourced in the UK, it's sourced in the US and then flown to the UK. And Japanese designer casual wear, which is made in China. And then society and family units is changing. We no longer have the worker, um, as in the slide of the vineyards. Uh, we now have hybrid families, increasing single households, uh, caring at a distance, multiple location living, um, all contribute to contemporary differing retail uh, demands. So moving on to our uh, project at the ILC. Uh, so that's 18, 18 months um, of work around this area um, and looking at it uh, in, first of all, there are so many different topics in this space and it's, it's really prioritising what, what to have most impact first. But essentially we want to support retailers to better understand the evidence around aging. So taking some of that data, that academic research, um, and translating that into something that retailers can, can run with. We want to inspire action in retailers in their relation to their role in supporting helping aging, because there is a responsibility. How can there not be a responsibility in, um, in looking after their consumers um, we want to transform how the retail sector sees, employs and serves older customers. And I think employment's a really key, um, key word there. And then by implementing these changes, it both in dialogue, in action and policy, um, others across the life course are favourably affected. So everyone hopefully wins in this project. And examples of what we're doing and proposed to do. Well, uh, we, would, we would like to influence and lobby local councils, local and national government to consider environmental infrastructure. And by that, I mean transport funding and timetables, uh, targeting retailers through decision-making departments, um, HR team and CEOs publishing a series of retail-friendly white papers throughout the year, coinciding with the retail calendar, um, working with retail associations to inspire and guide their members who are stretched across the country, uh, and then social media campaigns direct to the public, increasing awareness of priorities. I think you only have to look at um, the grassroots up um, effect on a dialogue about the menopause to understand the cause and effect and how we, we can change things by going to the top and uh, not the bottom, but, uh, but the, the wider um, general public. And through a newly published report, uh, the health of older people in places that the ILC has uh, recently published, um, we asked government to earmark part of the levelling up fund for projects creating jobs suitable for older workers, especially in unhealthy areas such as night shifts. So I'm just going to talk about an example of a specific issue um, in that the high street needs to be welcoming and accessible. And I would also include hospitality and leisure in this. And it was interesting in, in the uh, dementia report that we are um, releasing today, uh, there, is, there is no substantial 
research that's done into the effect um, of uh, theatres, cafes, restaurants, and how they work with a, uh, a dementia population. There's nothing at all which is, is really interesting and needs to be changed. Um, and I was looking at a government UK disability service that said 77.9% of those disabled people said that shops and shopping centres were either completely inaccessible or had extreme difficulty in accessing. Um, and more than 27% of bus services, for example, in England have disappeared in a decade. So we need to find some solutions uh, across the board for this. Um, and again, referencing our report this afternoon, one in four people with dementia have just given up shopping because it is too difficult um, to be able to uh, do something that 80% that of people with dementia love. So it could start with, um, for example, for people who, who are able to cycle, better segregated cycle paths, and maybe looking more, uh, more closely at how pedestrianised high streets can be uh, can have a clearer right of way so that you understand the rules and regulations around stepping into the road. Um, retailers, perhaps, to sponsor more dial-a-ride schemes in rural communities as bus routes have been cut so significantly and uh, perhaps I know it might be a dirty word but um, incentives or swap outs for hybrid cars um, perhaps day hire car could be better facilitated or perhaps a petrol car incentive swap for a hybrid equivalent for older people this is so that independence and environmental needs can be better met as we age if the car is going to remain a staple going into the town centre. And business improvement districts can be more engaged. And so this is to better improve the commercial offer in our towns and cities, concentrating on the ease of access. And then an open dialogue with retail associations about uh, shop front access, looking closely at um, sustainable transport funds to create growth and cut carbon. Um, we can plan our retail sp spaces better with management of traffic flow and footfall at peak and quiet times, and then redesign the public transport accordingly. So the second uh, and final um, specific issue I'm just going to raise is that retailers need older customers and a healthy, inclusive workforce. Uh, and by 2030, which is not long, over 20 million people over, will be over 50 in the UK. And a, a, a good example of the Greater Manchester households, age 65 plus, that spending power is increasing by 280 million a year. Yet almost half, 49% of employees are either over or underskilled for their current jobs. And it costs approximately 4,000 pounds to replace each member of staff. And you think about how quickly the hospitality industry turns over staff. You need to be able to retain those, uh, those members and invest in them. And so it could start with something as simple as a, a seat. Um, this is a drum stool that's been in a shop in West London for about 20 years. It was a, um, a, a large wooden seat until somebody broke it previously. Um, and what's lovely about that is that it's placed in the middle of the shop. It's not placed by the stockroom and the staff encourage uh, whoever sits in that seat, who's, whoever's taking a rest, to chat with the other customers because the, the wrapping um, section and the till point is, is just behind them. We could, as, as Lee talks about, replan retail space so that wheelchairs and buggies can actively get into shops. Rent out a space to a new social enterprise. For example, the picture on the far right, um, far right um, was a church that had um, 
uh, a, a patch of green space um, accessible in the high street and they put uh, blocks for seats out in the summer and um, I'm sure uh, took uh, a, a small percentage of that very successful coffee van there. So using any space that retailers have in a dynamic way. Overhauling HR handbooks regarding inclusivity. So retailers to look closely at uh, things such as the Equality Act um, to make sure that their legal responsibilities to customers are actually covered. Um, Scrutinising night shift contracts so that retailers ensure the health of their customers um, are, are looked after and building knowledge, uh, skills and competence in that workforce, addressing discrimination and supporting diversity and adapting to the workplace. So we believe that society has to adapt now so that we can all enjoy the benefits of longevity. We can instill inspiration, offer support to retailers and create lasting impact within this exciting new project. So thanks very much for your time. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Elsa. And I should say, my wife won't thank me for saying this, but she, I think she does spend more time in the uh, museum gift shops than she does in the museum. Um, I'm probably also guilty of that. Um, and the, the point about employees, uh, just to pick up on, it's really interesting because I don't know if you saw that a, a month or so ago, McDonald's had another campaign to get more older workers. Uh, really, really interesting. McDonald's have been having these campaigns every now and again for about 15 years um, and, and struggling a little bit to do it. But, but it's a really, really important area. And, and I don't think whilst the age of retail employees is, is, um, isn't necessarily young, particularly in certain sectors. Um, one of the things that strikes me as really interesting in this space is we still hear about the B and Q, per, but, you know. So, the, so basically, the B and Q story of what B and Q do is they employ this nice old man who knows how to fix a nail and he knows what all these devices are and things like that. So, B and Q started doing this in the mid nineteen nineties. This is almost thirty years ago now, and B and Q is seen as the example still. And I think this is where we need to push the agenda forward. That actually, so maybe one aim is in eighteen months' time we're not talking about B and Q or indeed McDonald's because the McDonald's stuff is now what twenty years old. Um, and so, so, so maybe there's some progress we can make there. Um, I'm going to pass on to um, to our next speaker, who is um, who is Frankie, who is a PhD researcher doing some really really interesting work around small and local shops and convenience stores. Um, Frankie, yeah. thank you. Um, hello everyone, and um, so I started my PhD full time in December of 2019, um, I've since started working so I'm just finishing it off part time now, um, I'm going into sort of my final year of, of writing up, um, so I'm very grateful to be able to present my research um, at the event today, and it's exploring the shopping experiences of older people and the role of local shops in um, supporting them to participate and keep mobile in their everyday lives, and to age well in their local neighbourhoods. Um, so today I'll just sort of give you a brief introduction about what, what my research is and the rationale behind it, um, the research questions that I've used, and touch quickly on methods of data collection and analysis um, that I've used, and then collect some of the key themes um, that are starting to emerge from the, the data. Um, okay, so my interest in this topic was sparked by the fact that until more recently, older people's shopping experiences have largely been overlooked. Um, both within academic literature and in retail sector discussions. Um, so my research aims to explore these shopping experiences and give us some a greater insight into the potential for shopping and the range of activities that it encompasses to directly improve well-being in later life and to contribute to aging successfully in place. Um, and I'm particularly interested in the role of local shops uh, because these shops are often at the heart of our local communities and provide an important space for social interactions. Um, so I've just focused my research in Dundee um, as an aging population. So the number of 65 to 74 and 75 and over age groups will uh, was projected to increase by 12% and 8.5% 
um, between 2018 and 2028. Um, and it was also interesting considering the research in the context of deprivation. So we've got a diagram there from the scholarship index of multiple deprivation. Um, Dundee is a city that is some uh, is experiencing like widening social inequality that has been made. Uh, there are some you know, deep rooted social issues that have been made worse by the pandemic and in the cost of living crisis now. So um, this map shows that 37% sort of, of people in Dundee live in data zones that are within the most 20% uh, most deprived in the whole of Scotland. Um, so my literature review, my first year, I came up with the, the following four research questions and uh, that sort of look at how older people negotiate their uh, neighbourhood environment on their journey to and from and inside the local shops, um, including you know, how they get to and from shops and you know, what transport they use, and the barriers and enablers that they might experience when they access the local shops, and the social role and the social aspects of shopping locally, and then perspectives from local retailers and how they fit into wider discussions. Um, and we have talked about um, you know, creating age friendly high streets and town centres. Um, so it was a qualitative research project, and I've collected data using written and photographic diaries, semi structured interviews, and accompanied shopping trips where I made observations about the, the social interactions that older people had as they shopped. So in total, I spoke to 12 older people, they were aged between 76 and 90. They came from different areas all across Dundee and participated, uh, of the, the 12 people that participated in the research, there was seven that completed a diary keeping task. It was an eight week diary keeping task before they did an interview. And then of those seven, um, five agreed for me to come along on a shopping trip with them. Um, also conducted interviews though with local retailers and um, so putting convenience stores, green grocers, gift shops. Um, that was slightly more challenging due to the, the impact of staff shortages and pandemic and stuff. So Lee very kindly put me in touch with people from the Scottish Grocers Federation and um, you know, some of the, the key team members who've been involved in the Go Local program. And those interviews, I felt they, they helped to situate uh, the perspectives from the local retailers within those wider discussions uh, around some of the challenges and opportunities facing the retail sector. Um, so I'm sort of I'm here uh, in terms of data analysis. Uh, so using Braun and Clark's thematic analysis approach to analyze the data that I've collected. So around step three, I've been generating some initial codes um, from the data. And uh, for some themes now. it's a work in progress. Uh, so I'm going to talk about some of the, the key points I think have, have come out of the data. Um, so, Social interactions with stop, uh, shops that um, all of the older people who participated in, in the research tended to do a regular food shop at a, a larger supermarket uh, with Lidl and Aldi being popular choices uh, due to their convenience, their location, um, freshness and quality and the variety of products on offer, and obviously the price. Um, and there was the, the option to pick up bargains from reduced sections and stuff. Um, but all of the participants also use their local shops uh, regularly, particularly even the convenience stores to top up during the week and um, use and uh, pick up their newspaper um, or use the, the local post office if had one. And they also use greengrocers, butchers, bakeries, gift shops, pharmacies, uh, uh, health shops uh, regularly as well. And although there are various reasons that influenced um, which local shop they chose to shop at, and particularly like things like the environmental concerns, and thinking about food waste and, and plastic packaging. And so, if you're shopping at the green grocers for smaller portions of like butchers as well, for smaller portions of fruit, veg, and meat, and, or going to the second day bakery and, you know, for cheaper baked goods. And one of the most important things that, that came out of the, the data is that social interactions. With, with shop staff at local shops um, is really important, particularly for those people who live alone. Um, so for example, one participant talked about knowing the owner of a local gift shop. He had been there, he'd been there for 25, 30 years, and she always makes a point of going to his gift shop um, and buying something if she's looking for a gift for somebody, or other times just calling in, just have a catch up, and there isn't the expectation that you have to buy anything when you're in the shop. Um, 
This participant also used her local butcher regulation, known them for many years as well. And uh, she, you know, every time you would go in, they would always stop and have a chat and ask how her family were. Um, so another participant talked about his relationship with staff at his local pharmacy. They know him uh, on a first name basis, and he was very friendly with the chemist who had previously worked there. Um, and you know, they would chat about the, the chemist's fishing trips, and, and he would bring home sometimes you know, a fish if he'd caught one for the participant and his wife. Um, the participant felt that there was more opportunities for meaningful conversations with the staff in smaller local shops. Um, another participant had talked about a conversation she'd had with a, a staff member who, again, she referred to very fondly and on a first name basis about their different um, cultural and religious beliefs. Um, the participant described how this staff member referred to her, we always referred to her as sweetheart and treated her with respect, um, quote, despite the stick and her greyness. Um, so that same staff member also specially ordered her in the newspaper that she preferred every week as well. Um, and they felt that social interactions had obviously become even more important during the pandemic, um, whenever you know, people were generally more isolated and they had heightened feelings of anxiety and um, their social lives had been greatly diminished. This sentiment was also echoed by the owner of the local greengrocer, um, who said that he was overwhelmed by how the local community had come together during the pandemic and volunteered to deliver veg boxes um, to their vulnerable customers. So the staff and volunteers at this greengrocers, they delivered uh, 300 boxes a week um, throughout the pandemic and managed to raise 2,200 pounds for their local food banks as well. Um, and he felt that there had been a revival in a sense of community along the high street and he hoped that it would continue after you know, lockdowns ended and everything started to return to normal. Um, he also talked about how important it was for older consumers to be able to have these conversations. So sometimes he'd say on a, a Saturday afternoon, there'd be 12 people in this quite small shop all having um, you know, different conversations and catching up with people that they knew. And this was something that he was able to do less of because of the restrictions at the time, because they only allowed one person in the shop or three. So he felt that all the people were missing that um, connection. And for some of his older customers, that, that was maybe the only social interaction or social contact they'd had that day. And he also felt that um, staff at his local shop played a role in remaining a constant for older people, um, particularly those whose cognitive abilities are maybe starting to decline. And um, they, they would notice maybe if somebody has become a bit confused or is a bit forgetful and tends to have the same conversation um, when they come in or when they starts to struggle to count out, out coins uh, when they're paying at the till and how he's had instance of when um, their relatives come back to visit at Christmas time and they would come into the shop and, and they'd have a conversation and, and they would ask how their mum or dad doing and he's able to gently then tell them Oh, I've noticed actually your mum was struggling the other day with you know, somehow she seems a bit confused a bit. So it's not a medical di diagnosis, but it is a sort of a moral, uh, a social responsibility to notice these things and pick up on them. Okay. So the other thing that uh, emerged really is the, the changes in the high street, which obviously the police talked about and also talked about today. Um, Perth Road and Lockheed High Street and Dundee have been the focus of a lot of the conversations that I had with all the participants um, and their experience of using the local shops here. Um, these communities were, have been described by all of the participants, really most of them that talked about this area as being uh, once bustling and thriving uh, villages, they were always referred to as the village, um, with a strong sense of community, uh, but that a lot of these family-owned shops have now left the area over time and there has been a decline in the quality and variety of the shops with an increasing number of pound shops and barbers, charity shops, coffee shops and betting shops all sort of moving in more recently. Um, and they appear to have replaced a lot of the vibrant and unique businesses that once made up the, the high street, um, including the head shoe shops, dressmakers, um, baby outfit shops, green grocers, uh, ironmongers, cobblers, there was He's like shops, dairy shops, like a whole list of different shops that used to be there. Um, and the, the older people's knowledge about the area that they lived in was you know, incredible. Um, 
So one participant who lived on the park road for 17 years, she described how they would used to refer to you um, as going up the village and you could buy absolutely everything that you needed on Perth Road. You didn't need to go into the town at all. Um, but the, she'd also felt that the decline in the variety of shops along the Perth Road had been mirrored by a decline in the variety of the people that lived there. Um, a lot of students move into the Perth Road area, which is right next to the university. They'll stay for two or three years and then they'll move on. Um, so there's that loss of um, community. Rocky um, is a slightly different area, the high, high levels of economic deprivation. There's also a lot of substance use in this area. Um, and one participant I felt that this had led to the displacement of older people from public spaces that they used to occupy um, and they would socialize with other older people there. So the example that she gave was um, in the center of, of Lockheed, which is Iron Boots, there used to be quite a, a large independent supermarket and had a big square seating area with older people in meat and the cozy and leather and, and hang out basically. Um, she described it as being a really social place to be, um, but that had closed due to um, so younger people, drug addicts um, being causing problems, uh, which had meant that they'd had to shut the area down and it was later uh, redeveloped and they've just removed the, the square completely. Um, those spaces, there were other spaces that she mentioned as well, um, that were, you know, they were free and warm, so if an older person um, couldn't afford to keep their heating on for too long, this is somewhere that they could go and sit and uh, it was a, a social occasion for them, which uh, I think Given the current situation of the cost of living crisis, we can appreciate how important these kinds of spaces are. Um, so the participant also felt that these kinds of things brought the, they were a space to bring the community together and alleviate some of the loneliness that older people in that area felt, uh, which she now felt that the older people are, are probably more lonely than, than ever um, due to the loss of these spaces. Um, another participant as well had talked about the, the Rocky High Street and how her friends, some of her friends had said that they, they don't go into the town, uh, the high street anymore. And uh, they, they feel that, that they're quite intimidated or quite threatened by the high number of drug users um, in the high street. Um, but this participant didn't bother her. She was quite happy still to, to go down the street and didn't feel bothered by it at all. Um, so another participant that lived in an area of economic deprivation um, where she felt like she had few adequate amenities um, and had no access to locally grown organic fruit and vegetables, um, which she would have liked because she described herself as being very you know, health conscious. Um, so she took me on a shopping trip around to her local convenience store, which was very small and had a lot of, um, so these three along the, the bottom, a lot of sugary drinks, sweets, white bread, things that she didn't want to eat or want to buy. Um, this one in the middle was the fruit and vegetable selection, which was um, quite poor. If you compare that to a photograph that was taken by a participant in uh, one of the more affluent areas, you can see a total difference um, in, in the things that were provided. So she um, felt like this could be improved because she wanted access to fresh, organic um, fruit and veg. Oh, and that's actually, I'll just mention that as an aside, that is some graffiti that's in Lockheed. Lockheed's really good for graffiti. And I just that mm -hmm. and took that photo, which loved it. Um, so overall, the participants felt that Dundee was a, it was a positive place to grow older in. Um, there was a lot of, you know, there's a lot of sheltered housing complexes. There's strong bus links, great transport links in, in Dundee, and obviously you have access to Nine Wells Hospital. And there's buses every 10 minutes to, to Nine Wells. So that, that, is you know handy for, for all the people. Um, there's also plenty though today that I've not had a chance to talk about where there are things that could uh, you know participants have identified that could definitely be improved um, to better support the older people, um, particularly as they're navigating their, their physical environment in their neighbourhoods. Um, so this particularly includes your know, aspects of the built environment, including better street lighting and pavements, and increased number of seating areas. And um, just we can talk about just. The, See in a shop, you don't have to buy anything, you just sit down and need a penny. Um, because a lot of the old people said they struggled if they were, you know, had a bag or two and lived up even just a slight hill. There was no seating areas for them to stop on the way. Um, there was things like, yeah, 
more access to public toilets, a better pedestrian crossings, and tackling things like litter and uh, antisocial behaviour and to make places feel a bit safer and, and nicer areas to be in. Um, hopefully this has just given you a bit of a, a glimpse into the very diverse everyday shopping experiences of all the people uh, who I think play a vital part in, um, they, they should play a vital part in, in rejuvenating reju reju high streets and town centres and creating <coughs> sustainable and livable um, societies. Um, so put some references up there. And I'll also just mention if anyone's interested, um, Dundee City Council have organised an exhibition. It's called History Tellers Dundee's Older People. Um, so it's on until uh, the 21st of December. I can provide more information afterwards. So moving on to, um, cool. Yeah, that's me. Thank you. Brilliant. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to pass on to George, and then um, and then um, we've got a bit of time for, for, for questions and discussions. A few sort of ones. I've got a friend of mine who um, in Bognor Regis is in my cycling group. Who's a guy, an older retired guy whose whose wife died a few years ago, and um, I, I mainly see him other than every Saturday on my bike road in the local Bognor bike community hub. And he started saying to me that he pays his pension directly into this bike hub, but typically to fix the bike that he's messed up this week. But actually, it's community. The reason he goes, it, I see him every time I'm in there, and he goes and then we'll see everyone else in the community who is part of that community. And he spends, he must spend a long, long time in his bike hub. But it's interesting. It's all about community. I think doing it in Dundee is really interesting. There's one thing that hasn't come up yet we'd be really interested to talk about is um, when I last went to Dun Dundee, the only time I've been to Dundee, so I was probably, um, you know, I, I'm probably talking nonsense here, but one of the things that really struck me, it was outside term time, and it was in the evening, and and there is very little conversation in this space about the nighttime economy and all the people, and one of the things that struck me is it is no surprise that you know, frankly, what was really interesting is I went into the Weatherspoons, that was pretty much the only place that had anyone in it. And one of the things that's striking is outside term time, you go, well, actually, there aren't younger people, frankly, anymore outside term time in some of these cities. So how do you create a nighttime economy that works in towns and cities where, where you may not have the demand for some of the buildings and services you've got? And then the, 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 final, the, the seating bit's really interesting. Was, is there anyone here who's involved with the iGo project, the iGo2, and the, so there's really some really interesting, Judith, Judith, really interesting projects about design of place and design of outdoor place. And one of the big issues there was the sort of competition for space and benches and how you manage design so that you didn't have young versus old and old versus old competing. In. But I met a lady at, um, from a local authority a couple of weeks ago who said that post COVID, she's um, in her high street, she's introduced picnic benches because one of the issues with chairs of course you're you know you're always you you've got your side to it you're not facing each other so she literally has put free picnic benches in the town center in somewhere in east london uh west london and she says that she's got this group of older men who come every day and they literally move these according to how many people into a funny shape and they just said but it's become their home during the day and she, she's had it now a couple of years no one has stolen them no one has taken them but actually and she's sort of become friends with these people it's a really interesting idea about actually you know and probably shows it says a bit around the need for local leadership as well in terms of some of these things but anyway i've rambled enough i'm going to pass on to george to add a few words before we come to is that right, George? Uh, that's right, yes. yes. So, thank you. Well, there's almost a sort of character in the play that everyone talks about and no one ever sees. <laughs> but, uh, um, so, I am from UK Research and Innovation, which sort of does what it says on the tin. We fund academic research and business innovation. And specifically, my role is around healthy ageing. And a key part of my role in healthy ageing is um, helping people live well with cognitive impairment. Some of the major points in the journey of people living with dementia are driven by decline in independence, decline in social interactions, decline in the ability to do the things they want to do, the so-called activities of daily living. And I now look back at my own mother's journey through later life, and I can see actually how um, her mental and physical health declined in step changes, step changes that occurred when her pet died, when she had to give up her driving license, 
actually when she um, was ill and couldn't walk again and moved into a care home and was then disconnected from her friends who she used to see daily and now saw monthly. And eventually in COVID, when she was disconnected from her family uh, and isolated and actually improved when actually we were allowed back in the home. So these sorts of things matter. And sort of what struck me about this morning is the moral case for doing something is really very clear. And, you know, some of the things that Lee was talking about speak to policy. What can you do? You know, the, the, the VAT situation, the planning situation are things that policy that can pick up on that moral case. But the real issue is actually what's the business case for retailers to do something? And I think that's where it was really interesting. And in a connection between the two, Lee mentioned the 20 minute neighborhood. And that made me think of uh, a neighborhood that I went to see very early on. So um, Elsa talked about naturally occurring retirement communities. And there's one in South Manchester where they got together with, with the people living there and tried to understand why this community wasn't livable. And everyone used to find a taxi to go to the shopping center. And actually the obstacle was park benches. You know, they could get to their local shop if they could rest on the way to and from with what they're doing. Now, now there's a really interesting connection actually with what Frankie was just saying, because in a previous existence, I did a major piece of work uh, in England on community policing. And, and this was about low level crime and disorder. And one of the things that you know, was current at that time was finding where young people gathered um, and removing the reason for them gathering. So removing the phone box, removing the park bench. So I asked little people, actually, do you have a problem with youth disorder? I say, actually, not at all, because when I'm sat there on the bench, the young people in the area actually come sit down and start talking to you, and you get to know, you get a bit of social control. So some really interesting things, that 20-minute neighbourhood. Um, I was also struck by the sort of social glue um, piece, and the added value. So that walking to and from shops instead of taxis, you begin to see that actually maybe a slightly more expensive convenience store is actually still cheaper as, a, as an overall experience. Um, but that business of social glue is real. And that same policing project I did, we, we had a tactic for checking up on the local police forces on how well they knew their communities. And we'd arrive at somewhere, find a taxi rank, ask a taxi driver, where he would recommend we didn't go because it was this order, ask him to take us there and we'd drive around and find something like a corner shop. And then we'd have a conversation in the corner shop and say, what's going on in this neighborhood? They knew everything. Um, and so they, th this business about social glue isn't just a notion of you know, friendly old, you know, old world. There's a real community, and I was really struck again by what Frankie sort of said about the response of the local community and local retailers in COVID, bridging that piece again that, that um, Lee talked about, about getting that local retail and delivery system. So a bit of online ordering, a bit of, bit of local, local delivery going. And, you know, I said, well, where's the business case? You know, we're beginning to indicate where there's a case for doing this. I think the report that will be launched this afternoon um, is a start. What else is doing will continue that start and is really important. What's going to be most important is actually finding some retailers who really pick up on these things and can then be demonstration sites to say this really works and get a few more photographs like those ones of the bench or the seat in, in Elsa's thing to say that it's there. And on the way, think about actually the institutions that fund large centres or, or local retail thing. So where are they in, and where is their responsibility in actually making these places uh, dementia friendly? So I think that's all I sort of wanted to say to wrap up. I mean, really, um, thank you very much to the three speakers for, for, for all that. Um, and David, over to you. For some and can I ask our speakers to perhaps come to the top table now? Um, We'll, we'll have a bit of time for some questions. It's but I think really struck by a couple of couple of points around the um, around the issue of um, 
you know, the perception and reality of, of, of old versus young is a really interesting one. I think the, the IDGO project as well, one of the things that came out of that is actually it takes years for some of these interventions to deliver change in behaviour, because people don't know the town centre's changed, so therefore they don't change their, be their behaviour. But I remember when I, I did a thing with a group of, um, in a day centre within a care home um, with a group of older men once, and... Um, and I said to them, so what do, you, what do you think about the bus travel? Do you use your freedom pass? You know, do you go back and put on the bus? And, and the, the common message from pretty much all this is in caution. So, you know, it's probably not a big public transport area, but those are sort of, you know, what did you, um, you know, what did you think of, um, you know, the public transport? You know, what do you think of the bus? What do you think of the freedom pass? And you say, oh, it's really annoying. All the kids put their feet on the things. They make this noise. They're really annoying. I find it really, really stressful. When were you last on the bus? Never been on the bus. Um, <laughs> and I think there is something in this space about actually our perceptions and realities and, and that actually I think we probably need to have a role in challenging people of all ages around actually, you know, give it a go. It may not be that bad and maybe you could chat to the person on the bus instead. So at that point, I'm going to stop and ask if we have questions in the audience. I think we might have one or two online, but do we have questions or, or comments? If you want to have a comment, please do. Um, go on, and say who you are. Do we need the microphone or not? Fine, fine. Okay. Um, I'm Alexandra. I run a podcast called Independent Thinking, exploring how the industry is changing. Um, thank you for the speech. It's really fascinating. Um, in a job previously, I worked in active travel, and I'm, I'm really fascinated to see that thread really be strong mm. throughout all the, the uh, presentations. But one thing that really struck me was that. When we've been speaking to each other before, there's a real opposition and a real feeling that actually cycle lanes and pedestrianisation really like are, are a real barrier to spending money to, to get people. So how do we work with how do those two industries or how do these two kind of like travel and retail work too closely to actually some to debunk some of these discussions about the impact of pedestrianisation? Does anyone want to come into that? Lee, do you want to sort of start? I'll make a brief yeah. comment about it. You're dead right. Um, there is a perception by many retailers in urban spaces that the majority of their, their customers come by car. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways that Sustrans has had a, 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 some success in beginning to do that is by actually doing some survey work with them, doing some talking to the customers, pointing out then when you get the evidence base. Actually, a large proportion do come by cycle or do come by walking. And that actually, the volume of purchase over periods of time is often higher for cycle, particularly cycle. And as a result, um, I think you begin to win over hearts and minds one by yeah. one and demonstrate where these things go. So it's a classic academic answer. Go back to the evidence. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think I've seen studies from Canada and places that basically you have this huge opposition. Um, they bring in these cycle lines, make it really, really difficult. And all of a sudden, six months later, the retailers say, this is bloody fantastic. Why did we not like it? There's something about actually. And, and I think that there is clearly there's some infrastructure issues around things like, um, you know, so my cycle group, we, we go all around the, the local area, 20, 30 miles. Typically, we go to a small cafe. Why do we go to a small cafe and not Brighton? Because there is nowhere to park cycles in Brighton and where it wouldn't be taken. There's no cycle storage for e-bikes. There's no, and I think, again, thinking about how the interrelationship between the town centre and space is actually, you know, you're not going to get people going into those places unless we've got the infrastructure lead. If you want to come back? Yeah, th there's an analogy there. So I think the, the issue is not with the issue of travel. If you think about um, low emission zones, you think about some of the streets being closed off due to COVID, you think about some of the pavement restaurant elements that were going up, people being really very resistant to it. And then the evidence and the people who are actually using it. So it's often a vociferous minority that are saying, you can't, you can't do this, you shouldn't do this. Um, so I think it is about driving evidence and, and actually doing stuff, taking it from that. Great, thanks. Anyone else want to come in on active travel or? Uh, I mean, I think uh, just to build on, on what's been said, I mean, it is all about making wherever it is a destination that people actually want to be. And I think they will work through whatever uh, the conditions, if, if actually what they want is actually on offer in, in those places. And I think one of the challenges that we've got right now is that so many places 
are losing a lot of what, what, what's on offer. So unless some of those things are filled back in, it's 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 probably not the sustainable transport that's putting people off. It's the offer at the, um, when they arrive. That's great. Other questions? Yeah, and do say who you are. Say your yeah. Go on. Hi there, I'm um, Julie from Altro. Um, obviously, there's a lot of new racing um, going around Scotland um, and the country, I um, suppose. Um, there's a lot of new racing um, programs where they're refurbishing old facilities beside where they're building new facilities. Is this maybe an opportunity to bring back the neighbourhoods of the retail, like Frank you was saying? Um, you know, go back to the photograph of the 1965. I remember that going up myself, you know, where you had all the shops, yeah. butchers, the, you know, and I'm not valued. Um, <laughs> so, you know, to bring it back in, you know, when you've got opportunities with, you know, local authorities who are building new homes and bringing families in, is this an opportunity to maybe then introduce again the, you know, the, the neighbourhoods of shops um, as opposed to going to the one to Anyone want to come back on that? Um, I'd like to respond to that. Um, I, I think that there is a um, an issue with the, the the type of shop that is being allocated to those new um, uh, building um, uh, corporations, and that that perhaps more work needs to be done on the um, as you say the the diversity of the shops that are allowed to be in that, um, you know, there, there might be confines in terms of contractual agreements to a particular supermarket chain, and and if if there could be work done, I mean, I, I don't know how um, realistic that is on making sure that that offer is more diverse than being linked to a particular brand or a particular chain. Um, that might encourage that diversity that you're talking about. Anything else want to come in? A, a couple of observations. Um, the, the council estate that my grandparents grew up on had a parade of shops in the middle of it. People will recognize that model, I think. Um, what wasn't present was car ownership. And I think that is that yeah. sense of how people moved around places and lived in what they needed, and that gave you the mix. What we have now, um, and if you think about some of the things going around Edinburgh, it's a good example. What you've got are housing estates that built around the car. And that's the model. And that is currently privileged by the fiscal nature of the way we tax land, the way we tax parking spaces in town, out of town, the way we do the refurbishment. So yes, we need to build the facilities there, but it might needs a much more radical change about what we're actually doing, where we build houses, what we're trying to do with them, and therefore what we need. But if we build large estates on greenfield land around car dependency, we're not going to build places that really don't be that satisfying. Yeah, um, what, what about does anyone what about more housing on the high street itself? Do you see that as being part of the solution? Well, I, I think that's a really sort of interesting development, yeah. and, and you know, to take sort of Lee's sort of idea forward. So, I think a lot of retirement villages started off being built in places where you could drive to, and it was convenient. Yeah. And now, more of the thinking is actually: is are they places where people want to be? So certainly around us, more, more of the new developments are actually um, nearer the town centre within walkability of, of that sort of 20-minute neighbourhood sort of idea of, of thing. So, so some of that logic is, is changing, um, but I, uh, and I think some of that will have to be down to planners, but, but actually repopulating some of our smaller town centres with people who want to be there and want to live there, I think is part of a movement that, that um, can offer um, a, a different retail future. Great. Um, other questions? Leslie. 
I just wanted to touch on a point of view of something in relation to basic markets and a first hand experience in the role of architectural practice that we've had clients who are horticultural centres who produce a lot of selling of projects and actually met with restrictions and tension at planning stage because that very small community shops would affect to the very large UK wide retailer that was in that area. And that struck me as such a difficult thing to do how we could bring something more flex by certain big jobs. And my reflection on that was really that we really could be looking to make that change by ourselves through our buying power, that if we all genuinely want to move to that high street model, then we have to think very carefully about who and where we're buying from on a weekly basis. And the second point, really an observation, was that a number of years ago, as the city council went through a process of training all their planners on health impact assessment methods, which wasn't necessarily a mandatory requirement, but certainly if you received a planning application that was perhaps or take you shop, you could then at least go through the methodology to assess whether or not you were approving a number of kebab shops, takeaway shops, cash converters, and gambling shops all along one high street and recognizing the impact of the planning system we have on that. That's a difficult point when you have a town centre with very few people interested in taking their shops if you don't put them in today. But I think we do have a wider obligation to have a planning system to consider the downstream impacts of the decisions as Great. Does anyone want to say anything about planners and health? The only comment I'd make, certainly, in talking about the RTPI up here in Scotland, the planning profession has been hollowed out by councils of technology, so the numbers that they have. I think there has been a commitment, someone may correct if I'm wrong, from Scottish <laughs> Government, I think to expand the number of planners and clearly that sort of background and understanding, all of that becomes more important when you get to the company. Great, great. Just a point to add, yeah. I think yeah. in the past in week or so, there's been a commitment or a motion in Glasgow City Council around feminist town planning and using that in how they approach planning. So it, Maybe there's an interesting question around how do we ensure that healthy aging has that approach or that, you know, in the conversation around the future of planning. Yeah, absolutely. And there's there's a there's a question online that makes the same sort of points of, um, from David's Dave points around um, yeah this loss of planning and the loss of regional planning. I was talking to a, a planner recently who was saying you know they were saying that actually their job is now to oppose housing developments and then it gets redone and then they approve it and it's they they don't plan anymore basically because what but they don't have a chance to plan for demography because basically they're not paid to do that. They're paid to look at a a scheme and then approve or disapprove and a real actually a sense of frustration i think they don't don't have that sort of opportunity so i think there is a there is a challenge and you know i think got to go. just one little yeah. thing we sometimes blame planners and it may not be the planners um judith probably knows where i'm going with this in terms of sterling and the planners rejected an out-of-town development um in sterling for an asda furthest side and outside of the town centre and the members of the planners so the elected yes. members out of yeah, yeah. Um, and that sort of thing so when we say planners i think we need to think about the planning system not necessarily sure. planners yeah. themselves absolutely other questions or thoughts before we stop for lunch i might i might pick judith pick on judith sorry judith um, um, around sort of, and, and, and one of the points you made, and indeed Lee, around sort of the, you know, one, one of the things in this space that I think is really, really difficult is the predicting the future and the, um, you know, the what people want. And, and, and you made, made this point and Lee did at the end, you know, and, and how do you listen to listen to the voices of, of older and indeed younger people. And, and I think there's a really interesting sort of challenge here in the context of, you know, that I, I always come back to that, that Ford quote of people would say they want a faster horse if you ask them to design something. And actually how well equipped we are as individuals, whether we be older or younger, to, to actually start to influence community in place, given that actually, the market pressures are so huge and, and pushing these. But I don't know, Jude, if you want to comment on that or more broadly about how you involve all the people in this space um, in terms of broader sort of community engagement. Yes, I think we need to make older people quite central to the argument here and, you know, certainly give them a voice 
in, in, in our in, with business and retailers uh, exactly what they want. And what strikes me, though, is a lot of the issues we talked about this morning apply to all of us. It's not just older people. Um, you know, I get really frustrated if I go into a shop and they change the, the, the shelves around, you know, and the next one's doing so. You. Well, you know, but um, you know, we're the product placement has changed yet again, or the layout has changed. So, you know, a lot of the barriers that we face, we all face, um, it's probably extra difficult for people who are living with dementia. But you know, I think I think that actually all of us need to have that voice, um, mm -hmm. just the same as older people in, in a sense. Um, and so I think perhaps winning the argument and incentivizing retailers to do something should be um, on the back of all of us and all of our voices, not just older people, but you know, making sure that we are actually recruiting nuances of age in, in some of those arguments. Um, I mean, I, I, I was struck to by, by us this diagram of Great Bado um, and, and the, the opportunities and the, the optimism there was, I think, in, in the 1960s and 70s in, in developing and and designing town centers. And I think we are going back to that kind of model um, without the car. Um, and so I do think we need to be thinking about you know, the next generation of what we want and really advocating for that as well. So I think it's the responsibility of all of us to have our homes. Sorry, no, no, and thank I, I think um, it's a, a final comment from our panel, George, anything from you broadly? Just uh, I love the piece about active travel because I think there's a real connection between net zero and aging well at any age um, and the activity. And I, I remember reading some really interesting research in the, in the, from the US where, where the average size of people in a city was also correlated to its walkability. Absolutely. Um, it's time to be radical. Mm -hmm. Big. Brilliant, brilliant, good challenge for us. Elsa, are we going to be able to think radical? Think Absolutely, um, and I think it's it's a two pronged attack, and we can go to the top, and we can um, <clears throat> work from uh, grassroots up. Um, as Leslie said, we do have we do have um, power. The, the consumer does have power to to change this. Brilliant. And finally, Frankie, final um, comments. Probably just obviously a challenge as ahead, but um, I feel quite optimistic about the future of our, our town centres and high streets. Um, and there's, you know, there's people here that are interested, we're, we're all having these conversations. So, um, yeah. brilliant. Brilliant. Well, I, we, we were, we're going to stop there. We will be back um, this afternoon to talk. Um, more specifically about the work we've launched on dementia and spending. But thank you for everyone in, in the, for those of you in the room, I think we might even have bento boxes now. For those of you not, sadly, you don't get that. Um, although we do have delivery these days, you know, so you can sort that out. Um, and um, we will be back, um, back in uh, at almost exactly, if not exactly half past one. But thank you very much for joining us here in the room and online. Thanks.
Really? I was, I was having difficulty this morning hearing people. Is it back if I use the. Yes, yes. Is this on? It is on. Yeah. Or you can use this one. No, I'll use this one because I'm going to walk around. Okay. You have to hold it there. Okay. How's that? Yeah. I want to start saying. <laughs> <laughs> always the temptation, isn't <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we are live. Welcome back, everyone. I hope everyone's had a lovely lunch. Uh, we had a very interesting and stimulating morning. Uh, I think it's wonderful covering the retail sector, which uh, is, is really there's not much a great deal about in, in the age-friendly literature. Um, so it's really good to, to introduce um, retailing that and looking at the issue of aging and particularly, and this is what we're going to focus on this afternoon, uh, shopping and uh, people living with dementia and the report launched from IRC UK. I'm Judith Phillips. I'm the Deputy Principal for Research here at Stirling University and Professor of Gerontology. And I'm also uh, have the privilege of being the Research Director for the Healthy Aging Challenge that uh, George leads uh, as Director. <coughs> this afternoon, uh, as I said, we'll be concentrating on the launch of the report. And we have a, a group of uh, panellists who are going to comment on the report. And uh, I will introduce them uh, when they come up and sit uh, on the podium to take questions. Uh, we will actually have a discussion, a few words from them, but also the opportunity for you, uh, both in the audience and online, to ask questions um, of the report and of our panel of experts. Um, I should, before we kick off, um, thank several people. First of all, um, the University of Stirling, which feels a bit strange, thank you <laughs> yourself. But, uh, anyway, certainly the, the team that's supporting uh, us this afternoon, for, or, or whole, the whole day actually, from the University uh, of Stirling, and particularly DSDC staff, um, and the ABRDN fin Financial Fairness Trust, and ILC UK for their support, both of the research and for this event today. So thank you very much. Uh, so over the next two hours, uh, as I said, we'll have a panel, but I'd like first to introduce David Sink there, who is going to launch the report. Um, many of you will know David, um, who has worked in policy and research over many, many years. David and I go back quite a long way, I think, uh, over 20 years. Uh, and he's got particular interest uh, in older consumers, active ageing, financial services, adult vaccination, and the role of technology in an ageing society. So before I invite David to come up, and just to remind you, um, that there will be a Q&A session, so listen carefully and think about some questions. Um, there will be the roving mic for those of you in, in the room, um, but for virtual attendees, please use the Q&A feature in Zoom to submit your questions to panellists and to David, um, and we'll try and address these in the Q&A session. Um, we have set up live captions, so please click on the live tra transcription transcription button on the ribbon of your screen if you'd like to enable these. I have no idea what live captions mean. <laughs> so, uh, I hope it's so right. so Oh, subtitles. All <laughs> oh, right. Okay. So, um, as you know, just switch on, on the, the ribbon. Okay. Thank you very much, David. I'm going to pass it to you to launch the report. Brilliant. Thank, thanks, you. Um, Okay, um, so um, we, we've lost our, we've lost our, I can't find the slides. Sorry about this. Immediately, uh, as soon as our tech person goes, we've lost the ability to do our slides. Give me one second. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Is it sharing? On the animation screen. Brilliant, brilliant technology. You're talking about technology and innovation, it's always the same. Okay, that's going to cut my time per slide down to about 10 seconds. So, sorry about that. Um, so, so, we've been doing this work over the last year or so, and, um, and my very, very short summary is um, people with dementia like shopping, they don't do it as much as they like. And there is an economic and social cost for, for the way that we actually fail people on, on, on the high street and, and that we do need to do more to innovate in that policy. And actually, uh, my uh, conclusion at the end is a lot of this is just about being a bit nicer to people. Um, so over the last sort of few years, we've um, we've done, um, the last year or so, we've been doing this work with the support of, of the Aberdeen Foundation. Um, we um, did lots of work, and I just thank my colleague Shirin who helped us with some of the writing up, but also Sophia who did all of this work, and I should say as someone who is not an academic, I know how long transcribing 44 interviews and then my bigger there. This was a huge amount of work, 44 interviews, a couple of interviews, analysis of Elsa. We then went and focused on, we did a round table and innovation forum. We, we tried to refine the ideas. So the idea was we didn't just identify the problems, we looked for some solutions. Um, and and it, it's a bit difficult and awkward doing Sterling because what we have here is a group of people who know a huge amount more than I do about dementia and design and planning. So, but I will try and bluff my way through it. But at the starting point is, of course, lots of have, us currently have dementia. There will be more of us in the context of an aging society. Um, there is a policy context, and this was touched on earlier by Lee, that but specifically in terms of dementia, that so you, England, I don't know, you might not remember these heady days of pre-2015 when we used to do public policy in England. Um, so, so but back in 2015, actually we led the world, you know, David Cameron led the world on dementia. We absolutely took dementia to the G7. We absolutely tried to convince governments across the world to, um, to be involved and really, really have a, you know, see this as one of the biggest challenges we're facing. And um, and but actually then since then really you know, on, on the one hand much of the investment has been in the biomedical side but even that the promise of the dementia moving shot was never really delivered um we never really measured the extent to which companies and other organizations engage with dementia friends um and we're still i think both in, in england waiting for a new dementia strategy so whilst you know there, there was and is recognition in, in most policy makers of the challenges um, actually, it's sort of fallen off the public policy agenda um, for, for lots of reasons. Um, one thing I suppose I just wanted to start off with is we, so we sort of decided to make a bit of a value judgment. You might sort of make a different, um, take a different view here, but, but actually, I think what we wanted to say here, because there are clearly issues around safeguarding here, there are clearly issues around risk, but I think where we wanted to come from was Oh, oh what's happened? Sorry. 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 Let's, what's that? Thanks, then. All right. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, clearly issues around safeguarding. And, um, so you see, I've got lots of slides. Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm going to be very quick, I promise. Um, and, and, and essentially, what we wanted to do was to um, say, look, actually, yes, we need to protect people, but actually, uh, and this came out in the event we uh, conversation we had last night. You know, there is an element of which we need to let people make mistakes, and that actually, um, if we overprotect people, the risk is the risk to well-being is much more significant than as actually um, 
um, you know, so, so actually the risk of locking people away versus the risk of actually allowing people to both make mistakes. And there's a real delicate balancing act here, but we're, we're edging on the let's support people to enhance their well-being through consumption and that let's really focus on what we can do from that side of things. We know people with dementia like shopping, um, and we know, as we heard earlier, that people give up and uh, give up early. We did some analysis of the English longitudinal study of ageing, which showed that between sort of, it was actually between just under um, a billion and <clears throat> two billion difference in the spending of people with dementia relative to people without dementia using ELSA. So you've got a, potentially a significant underspend. Um, and this is shown by this, this chart here, and um, I should have asked Sophia what, whether we controlled for income and, um, um, and age here, but broadly what you see is people who have dementia spend a lot less than people who don't have dementia. Um, so, so we've got some really strong evidence that, look, actually, there could be a boost to GDP if we can support people with dementia to spend the same sort of levels of um, of, their, of their colleagues and friends of the same age. In doing the work, we've identified lots and lots of barriers and sort of six big, six key themes, one of which is um, how do we get out and about? Um, one, how do we buy the stuff we want? Another, how we deal with being not respected on the high street. Um, real issues around feeling anxious about the retail space issues around confidence with financial services and then payments and paying, paying and really big thing. So actually the story, you know, from the point someone leaves their house, getting on the bus, getting on the train, through to the point they buy stuff, both in a virtual and online environment, there are a whole series of challenges, both carers and people with dementia highlighted with us. Um, so just starting through, and I'm going to run through these really quickly, but the slides will be available afterwards, and in some ways I should say that Mr Shirin spent lots of time wordsmithing. This is an alternative version of the report, in effect. What you've got here is a, a, a PowerPoint that allows you to read the report relatively quickly. Um, so transport is a really, really huge issue. It comes out, all, it came out from people with dementia and carers a lot timetables, just frankly understanding timetables, a massive, massive issue, and, um, and equally buying tickets. How do you buy tickets? And actually one of the things that was really interesting in this was actually the pre it wasn't just the how you buy pre tickets, but things like when you go into both the, you know, the shops, but look at the, the stations, but when you do it online, all of a sudden you're faced with all these choices that you don't want. Do you want to sit forward or backwards? Um, do you want to sit in an aisle or window? Do you want a table? And actually this in itself stressed people out as much as, as, much as anything else. Um, complicated journeys. You know, people talked about, you know, I'm, I'm happy getting on the train, but the minute something goes wrong and the train has to stop and I have to then get on another train, real, real challenges around how you navigate or if you have to change trains, um, a problem. And then this issue of confusing spaces, you know, actually places, stations can be <coughs> busy and they can be very difficult for people, airports in particular can be. Really clear that lots of people out there are doing some interesting things here, you know, the train, almost every train, but all the train companies often offer all sorts of support, airlines offer, and the airports actually do some really brilliant stuff, the airports. Um, um, but actually, one of the issues is that there's very, very low awareness of, of the offer that, that's out there. And I think there's a really interesting question here around, because um, when you talk to some of the providers, they'd say, well, and some of the actually brilliant people really trying to help people here. And they say, well, we do all this and no one knows about it. And it's like, I think there's a, there is a challenge around blaming the customer here and then we think the industry needs to find ways of saying well, actually this is our offer and we need to get it to you and one of the things I, I, I argued with my colleague Sophia when we were doing this because she was saying well, the problem is people don't know about it and I say well, I don't need to book an appointment for Tesco's you know why should someone have to book an appointment for special support and services and I, I think there's something about how we design services around around what people need but it's really clear that even the operators recognise that there is that there are issues. But moving on to sort of shopping, um, uh, and we heard <coughs> this morning, people find it really difficult making informed choices, finding things, and then issues around buying stuff you don't need. Really, really common theme around, and actually causes huge amount of anxiety around forgetting to pay. And actually, people really worried they'll forget to pay for something in the shop. 
Um, and this came out came out a lot from a number of the different different interviews. But but alongside that, a really interesting challenge which we picked up before we started doing the research from we'd seen these news stories from America of these sort of burly security guards running around chasing people with dementia who they thought shoplifted. And it's not uncommon. You can Google it and see the sort of news stories in the US, and it happens quite a lot. Um, but actually, there were some places, particularly local stores, who, who actually do try to find ways around this thing, you know, have a relationship with family members. They know someone's going to pick something up and forget to pay. They'll, they'll sort it out afterwards. And the point earlier around the importance of the convenience store in helping people, really, really important. Um, there are also initiatives like um, missing Mission Dementia in Austria, which is sort of a, a way in which the police have a tool to sort of help people um, navigate so they don't end up taking people to court. Uh, so, so there are some interesting things going on. Um, navigating around, clearly a massive, massive issue, as it, you know, generally in shops as well as in airports. People find it, you know, create huge amounts of anxiety. And, and staff often don't know what to do, even with training. And, and I think you see this, uh, you know, the disability, people in the disability movement talk about this a lot. And I think it's absolutely the case as well for dementia about, you know, actually how frustrating it can be when someone tries to do something for you and you want to do it yourself. And, and I think what, you know, well-meaning staff can potentially undermine independence by sort of forcing support that people don't want. But it's really, really hard. Um, addressing carers came up. So instead of talking to the person with dementia, you talk to the carer instead. So really, and it's not intentional, but actually it is unhelpful. <clears throat> um, the public generally, and I would count myself, you know, that, you know, have we ever tutted at someone in front of us in the queue who's being a bit slow? We ever got a bit anxious ourselves? Shopping environments are not easy. And, it, and, and you know, actually we, the public is not great at actually dealing with and supporting people who need a little bit of, bit of help. Etiquette, you know, particularly if there are people who just, you know, we have different etiquettes in retail environment that we've got used to and developed, and and sometimes the ability to remember what that etiquette is is is, is lost, and, um, and and that itself can cause real stress. Um, one of the big things that came throughout the whole piece of work was actually how do you identify people who need a bit of support, and we have now the. Um, the lanyard, the hidden disability lanyard, uh, or hidden um, the invisible disability lanyard. And, and on the one hand, there's this, you know, should I need to be wearing a lanyard to go into Tesco's to, you know, and, 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 you know, should I want to have that as a way of identifying myself? And there are, you know, risks and opportunities. Some people won't want that. Because of course, in some ways, you're pointing yourself out as being vulnerable, but there's some real, real risk in, in this space. Um, uh, and, uh, and and yeah, so, and I think actually, what well, you know, I'll come back onto sort of some of the issues around that. But actually, just identifying if you're a retailer, how do you identify if someone needs a little bit of help is is a real challenge. And then when there are people you've even identified, and it's particularly the case of financial services, people said that actually they they pretended they weren't vulnerable, and they pretended partly because if you're buying an insurance product and you have a condition. Sometimes you're a bit worried about telling people about what you, you know, about anything, because actually you might worry they won't serve you. They won't, might not offer, offer a product. So actually sometimes people deny, uh, deny sort of dementia and, and indeed other conditions. Um, but um, huge issues if we can't identify and can't support. And the, the professionals we talked about talked about actually that this challenge of if we can't if we can't identify people, how do we provide people with the support they need? And and this case, this issue of zero tolerance came up quite a lot. Um, and the challenges around this that you know and I, I'm sure you've seen some of the stories in um, the newspapers about supermarket staff facing huge amounts of abuse during COVID from, from customers. And, and I'm sure it still continues, but as a result of that, a lot of stores have a zero tolerance approach to, to abuse, which means if someone comes in and can be quite aggressive, it's really hard for a shop to know why they're being aggressive, what the issues are, where and how you support them. So again, the challenge around sort of if you're working in a shop or retail environment, how do you provide you know, identify the need. Um, as, as we mentioned, there are things like hidden disability lanyard, and I'll come back onto that. 
And uh, you know, quite a lot of, of people providing a little bit of help in, particularly in corner shops. Um, you know, one store manager said, I want staff to be able to recognize that buying 10 bags of tea bags isn't normal. You know, and I think there are things that, you know, one of the things I said back to, to Heathrow and the airport operators was that, you know, I appreciate you need to identify people, but, you know, I could probably look at people getting off Heathrow Express and identify that someone is struggling. They don't need a lanyard. They don't need. And actually, what I should be doing, you should be doing, is basically going to Heathrow Express, watching people get off the train, saying, look, there's a shorter queue over here. I mean, you know, not, you know, and I think there are all things that retailers and others can do to make it just a little bit easier. Um, people like Sainsbury's and Tesco, we heard before, have piloted these slow shopping sessions, and Santander have done some quite interesting things. So there is some, you know, there is effort being made by, by shops and retailers. I think it's a really interesting question coming back to your, your PhD is around is it easier for convenience shops? Is it easier for smaller shops? Is it easier where actually you know the people? And, um, and maybe though there was a suggestion of that, although I, I live in. I live in Bognor Regis, we have you know, quite a busy town centre, but frankly, there is, you know, six or seven, you know, people who are on radios each day talking to each other around security. They know everyone who goes into, you know, they know, you know, even in towns with 20, 30,000 people, you know that you get to know people who are going to the same shops every day. So, um, so uh, you know, it might be easier for small shops, but I don't think that should be an excuse in, in, in some of the bigger towns. There are some really interesting things going on in terms of training staff. So pharmacies are pretty good in this. Rail companies and airports, as much as I was nagging at them, actually they're trying, they really are trying to, to provide support that people need. Most of the financial service industry are being pretty good at actually training staff. They have to provide support. Um, Johnny will talk a bit about this later, but they absolutely have to be out there supporting and there are duties on them to do this. Um, the retail and the hospitality sector, I think, finds it a bit, diff a bit more difficult. There is some support from, for example, the Association of Convenience Stores, but, but it's fairly inconsistent support that is provided. Really, really important point generally, and I won't say very much about this because studying a much, much greater expert on, on this than I, but without a doubt, design is massively important, whether that be, you know, the overhead sign, the floor patterns, use of colour, loads of different issues got raised around the simple design of physical space and um, but also the design of the online environment and making sure it's accessible someone was talking one of the participants was talking about um and i can't well mention this as mary mary was talking to me about it yesterday um toilets and the design of toilets but actually going all beyond the how do you find toilets and do they exist to how can we create services where, for example, you can book a theatre ticket at the end of the roadway, you know, there's a toilet next door. And I think there are things like that where we're, we've still got a bit of a way to go, but it would be extraordinarily useful for people if you could do that more. Um, again, I'd say, it's, you know, Dementia Action Alliance have produced some interesting materials. I won't say, I won't steal the University of Stirling's funder, but clearly the the um the toolkit that's available and the assessments there are brilliant in this space um i think it's worth one thing i did want to flag briefly that was just sometimes this is about simple solutions you know that you know a simple checklist that allows a small provider to say look you know here are four things i can do to make my center a little a little bit more accessible absolutely brilliant and and um you know, the Castle Cinema in Hackney have specific screenings. There's a really interesting space in Newcastle, a Granger Market, which provides really interesting support for people in a sort of traditional market environment. Um, so, 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 you know, so there is some stuff out, out there, design extraordinarily important. Moving into the online environment, actually one of the things that sort of, I don't know if it's surprising or not, but actually quite a lot of people who mentioned in their carers like online shopping still, and they like it. You know, clearly massive issues, again, with design, which we'll come back up with, but generally, particularly early stages of dementia, you know, being able to shop online was still seen as being a really, really positive thing, but there were risks, and I'll come back onto that. One being, coming back to the earlier point about the retail environment, it's hard to identify someone who's vulnerable. You know, it might be hard on the high street to see someone, even harder if you're basically, you're, you're in an online environment where you don't, can't see the person or talk to the person at the event. Um, 
And having said that, is it really hard? You know, there's some pretty clever stuff they can do with technology to look at patterns and trends of behavior. You, I suspect it's not as hard as they say it is. Um, but clearly there are issues here about identifying the support someone might need. And as one parent said, you know, the, in the online, but also offline environment, there's people with dementia sitting next to financial abuse. Financial services was one of those things which, which was a really, really common theme. We didn't go out sort of specifically wanting to talk about it, but people thought, don't we end up there? Actually, let's just look at these slides a few minutes ago and thought, you know, these are the same for everyone. We all get confused by technical jargon or how we decide whether we need a product, um, making, you know, how, how we make decisions about investments and so on. Although that one at the end, I think is really important, you know, how, making sure we're managing the risk of people being attracted to risky behavior and making unwise financial decisions and how the sector can support people through that is, is important. Um, people, you know, there are things like direct debits which allow people to, to manage money, but, but again, it was highlighted that, you know, there are risks of overspending in some of these cases. And, and you know, this whole choice agenda in financial services is, is huge and makes, makes the world so much more complicated for all of us, but particularly people with dementia. Really clear that um, proving your identity in the online world is a significant challenge, whether that be through PIN numbers um, or passwords. People really struggle with struggle with some of these. Um, and, and again, this point of a reluctance to accept support sometimes, which can create problems in the financial service industry in particular. Um, and, and, and whilst sort of, you know, the, the online world works for many. Online banking is, I think, still one of those which for many people they really, really, really struggle, struggle with. And the questions around trust are really important here. And you know, people didn't feel like they had, you know, the support that they needed from, from the industry. And I, I don't know how you overcome that, but there was a sense that people didn't, weren't aware of, it didn't know there was support that the financial service industry could be giving to help them navigate products and services. Um, a really, really important point came out in this space around where carers were be given, being given responsibility for some certain financial decisions. And you had carers say, Matty, I can't manage money myself. Um, so you had and, and very little support for carers who all of a sudden have to worry about how you man they manage their own money, but also the money of someone else. And, and I think there's an extraordinarily important chance. There is a, a foundation that helps people, but I think there's probably more we could be doing in this space. And as you would expect, people say bank closure is making it much harder to get some of that little bit of advice on support. I think a really, really common sort of theme, and I think it's a really positive thing, is actually. Yeah, well, I wouldn't say almost everyone, but lots of people talked about how liberating a power of attorney was. How, you know, actually taking out a power of attorney allowed someone to continue to manage their money, manage their, manage their lives to the extent to which they wanted to. And it was seen as extraordinarily empowering and important. And I think it was only people who didn't have it that then realised the problems of not having it, the, the issues that were coming from the failure to do it. In doing this piece of work, though, we have you know, identified lots of issues, some of which are not new, but actually real challenges around cost, auditing, you know, whether banks accept multiple attorneys, being overcautious, so lots and lots of issues around actually setting them up. And of course, the most important one being that most of us don't set them up at all, and then we set them up too late, and, and in which, by which time it becomes really difficult to, to do. So, so actually, how can we, and I, I support people, how can we improve the process a bit to make it easier for all of us? Um, and it was interesting to reflect that talking to the financial service industry as well, actually they felt that there were real challenges here as well. So inconsistent, so, you know, inconsistent guidance on how to deal with customers who have a, a power of attorney meant that actually it was really difficult and there was a sense that they would quite like a little bit more guidance in this space. The final thing just to, to, to flag really is an area we've done lots of work in over the years is payments and we expected this to be a really uh, really big issue and it was. People talked about this all the time, not you know that how do I pay for stuff at the end and issues around struggling to pay with your preferred methods, forgetting receipts, um, when prices change, this becoming an issue if you always go in with a certain amount of money, uh, understanding value of items. So lots and lots of, lots of issues at the tip. 
Um, and actually sometimes made by worse by lots of questions. Like as we were saying earlier, you know, you'll get to the till and you ask all sorts of questions like, do you want a bag? Do you want a receipt? Do you want X? And, and then you think there's something about how we can make that process just a little bit easier. Um, one thing that I think surprised me was, but perhaps shouldn't, is that actually most of the carers and interviewees actually didn't see cash as being great. They didn't see cash as being great. And in fact, loved contactless. Contactless is seen as hugely liberating for people. It had a limit. You could go in, you go in, you don't have to worry about change. You, and, and there's something really interesting about actually how can we use some of this technology um, going forward to make sort of just make our lives a little bit easier. Um, but again, the issue of design, you know, the cards need to be designed well, the process needs to be designed well, and, and the risk of, and what caused anxiety was when the one in 10 or one in 20 times you asked for a PIN number, all of a sudden creates huge anxiety. So all the things that the industry could do with people with dementia is saying, you know, actually we won't ever ask you for a PIN on this card, um, and we'll protect you by having limits to the amount of amount you can take out. But so that so there must be, and of course, you know, actually we don't really talk about it in the report, but there, you know, there has been for you know decades now a chip and signature card, which the banks, even the, the banks who say they do a lot in this, will not tell anyone about. They're hidden away on their website. So you can have ask for a chip and signature card, which is a card which doesn't have pin functionality, and you have to sign for it instead. And but they don't like giving it out and they hide it away. But I think there is something about um, about that, things like that. Um, and just you know, to, to, to finish sort of, you know, what should we do? And I should say we've got about 80 different recommendations in the report. So we tried to summarize them, otherwise, instead of rather than in 60 slides, I've had, I've had about 160. Um, but we can talk about these in uh, later on. Really sort of summarize them in three areas. One people so so how do we ensure people get support from people uh, secondly infrastructure so design how do we make sure that the, the space is created in, in a way that um, the works for people and then technology how do we make most of technology in, in this space and people you know staff training understanding extraordinarily important easier to say than do but really really important as indeed is making it easier for people to dementia to, to find the support they need. Um, I think it's also important to think about actually how we support people with dementia to continue to work and, and in the retail sector. And, and I think there is some a lot more we can do in this space, and we haven't we haven't done very much in, in this space yet. Secondly, uh, infrastructure, so the, the dementia-friendly design extraordinarily important but also is the legal framework for the, for the right, to, right to support and then technology it, you know inclusive design uh, shouldn't need to be said but extraordinarily important uh, i think building on existing and emerging technology and encouraging innovation for the future so a couple of a couple of examples there are things we toyed with at our innovation uh, workshop one was um they say, you know, the, the, the issue of could we have an electronic or digital lanyard? And there is people thinking about this and thinking about how you do this. So you would go into potentially even a really small shop and the shop manager might get a text saying, there's someone coming in now who actually has a digital lanyard. Uh, this, is, this may be the sort of support you may need to provide them. And I, I, I think there is something in that. And I suspect certainly, you know, it may help in certainly some of the bigger areas certain uh, bigger tabs. Um, but secondly, we talked about things like how you use tech to help people navigate around towns. You know, there is now real time you know, in, in almost every city in the UK, but mo most cities in the UK, we have real time transport information. City map is a fantastic resource. Um, there is, it is not, you know, the tech already exists to allow us to have headphones that would help us navigate around the, that town using city map. It's not that complicated if you can get the APIs working. And I'm not a tech person, so it's probably much more complicated than I think. But actually, the theory is the tech is there, the data is there. Actually, you could have headphones, which was your wife or your husband or your partner giving you those directions. And one of the great things about things like City Mapper is that if all of a sudden the bus is cancelled, it changes the route for you. So, so I think there is something about how we use some of this high tech stuff as, as well. 
um, that is really important. And George will talk a little bit later about the longevity fund. But just to finish after my sort of geeky tech stuff, I think what was really interesting through the whole thing was that people, you know, a huge message was we, we just need to be nice to people. And that actually, if we had a retail environment and a high street environment where actually we'd be just looking out for each other a bit more, that, that hero example I gave us, instead of us having to follow this sign that, take, you know, that says you go to this place and have this accessible entry, you just look for someone who looks like they might need a bit of support and, and help them out. And I, a really, really common theme was that actually lots of shops and lots of people actually do this. So can we just build on this? And I managed to do 60 slides in the dark too quickly, but the slides will be available online. And thank you all so much um, for, for listening. Thank you very much uh, for a very interesting session. Um, comprehensive and I'm so impressed with the way you've run through so many slides. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, as you were talking, it was, you know, it, there's so many dimensions to this. And uh, I'm going to invite our panel members up now onto the, the front here. So Catherine, David, um, Johnny, Leslie, and, and Richard. And uh, if you could come up and I will introduce you um, as we start the next session. Um, but just to mention um, the report, which is, is excellent. It's wonderful to have the report. And thank you, David, for, for introducing us to it, uh, as I said. Um, what occurred to me was very interesting is a lot of this refers to urban areas and thinking about rural areas and some of the extra issues. I think it's going to be quite important. And yeah, David, you need to come up as well. Yep. Um, thank you. Thanks. Okay, so let me introduce our panel, and then they've got five minutes to reflect on what David has said. And uh, they've all got particular areas of expertise. But I'm sure they'll be drawing on, on the reporting and as well. So first of all, uh, Leslie Palmer, who's the acting director of the Dementia Services Development Centre here at the University of Stirling. Uh, Leslie's an experienced architect with extensive international experience in designing and advising on dementia-friendly design principles a non-pharmacological approach to supporting people living with dementia. Uh, next up will be Professor Catherine Hennessy, uh, who is Professor of Aging here at the University of Stirling. And Catherine is a social gerontologist, and uh, she is engaged in promoting interdisciplinary research and intergenerational research, actually, on aging and older people. Uh, I'm going to go with my list, actually, then, then I'll turn off the page. So right at the end there, uh, Richard Ward, Dr. Richard Ward, who's Senior Lecturer in Dementia and Ageing, again, at Stirling University. See, we've got a fantastic team here. Um, and he, he uh, is in social sciences with a background in social work, specialising in working with older people, and particularly working with people living with dementia. Moving inwards, uh, David Bell at the end there is Professor of Economics here at the University of Stirling. It's <laughs> getting very repetitive. Um, and he has an MA in Economics and Statistics from the University of Aberdeen, MSc in Econometrics and Mathematical Economics from the LSE, and a PhD from the University of Strathclyde. Uh, so, a real expert uh, in aging as well, actually. Um, and finally, uh, Johnny Timpson, OBE, Financial Inclusion Commissioner and a member of the Prime Minister's Champion Group on Dementia. Current Prime Minister? Or... <laughs> <laughs> I've not seen one for a long time. <laughs> right. um, so Johnny is a financial leader and business strategist with extensive work in the voluntary and financial sector. After leaving the Scottish Widows in 2021, after 33 years, he now works as an independent consultant specialising in inclusion, diversity and intersectionality. And among other positions, Johnny is a Cabinet Officer, Disability and Access Ambassador. 
and we hope you will continue in these roles in this current um, parliament and, and with the yeah. government because you're doing some fantastic work, Johnny. So thank you very much. Okay, let's kick off then. And, and of course, David, I don't need to introduce again, but David too, because he'll answer all the hard questions <laughs> on the report. Uh, but can I ask Leslie to kick us off with your five minutes of reflections on the report and the comments? Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Judith. So um, I think the first thing for me to yeah. I think the first thing for me to do would really be to welcome the report. Um, a lot of clients within DSC will come to us with concerns, frustrations, and identifying needs for future research, further research, and this is one that has come up in several conversations that we have. So thank you very much for taking that on. Um, I have three points for reflection and one point of an opportunity that I want to talk with everybody. Um, I'll start with the area that appeals to my discipline, which is architecture. Um, and one thing that I did notice was a dominant focus within the report around the physical retail environment. Um, and I was um, somewhat saddened, but it, it wasn't a surprise to see that three of the five barriers that were acknowledged in terms of getting access to retail relates to the built environment. So that being difficulties in getting out, anxious in relation to navigating the retail and leisure environment. And the third one, which is not always so obvious when you think about the physical environment, but feeling misunderstood and disrespected. And that's because we all have to remember that we, as users of the environment, um, actually play a critical role in how other people experience the environment. So staff have an integral role in making people feel comfortable within that space and people wanting to actually be in that space. So recognising that the environment has to do more, that's something we've seen before, and there's a lot that our high streets and retailers and leisure providers can do. Um, I'd like to place this in the context of other things that have been happening within the UK in around architecture and urbanism for ageing and dementia. And so this report comes just shortly after the launch of the British Standards Institute's new design for the mind, which is a public available specification. It's taken five years to write. And what that is, is the first step towards a British standard, looking at how do you design for neurodivergent individuals in the built environment. And it's the first time ever that we've saw a lot of research pulled together in respect to the ageing dementia people with autism, intellectual disabilities, and what the built environment can do to support them. So that's published. I would recommend you have a look at that if you have an interest in the built environment. One hopes that that finds its way into our building regulations and codes in the future. But the reality of the mechanism behind the standards is that it's likely to be five to 10 years at least before we see that. Um, if I were to be very hard nosed about it, we have the Equalities Act and service providers have an obligation to provide reasonable adaptations to support people within these environments. And so I was very much of the view that our retailers and leisure environments should be doing this now because they have an obligation under that act. Um, but the reality within the built environment has been predominantly looking at physical impairments as opposed to cognitive impairments. I welcomed Lee's conversation earlier around, earlier around the 20 minute neighbourhoods and just want to be um, kind of flagging, but also quite proud of the Scottish Government's progressive move in the National Planning Framework 4, which does recognise the need for the 20 minute neighbourhood. And now all planning policy within Scotland will be focused through the lens of the 20 minute neighbourhood. So any local development plans will be assessed using that. And I know that Ian Gilsey, the Chief Architect, has been doing work with his team looking at retrospective applications through planning and actually calling those back into question, realising that some planning developments had a negative impact on the town centre. Um, and then lastly, what I would like to recognise in that scope is really um, within the encouragement within the report to encourage retail therapy. Should you please keep me to time because I'm talking um, the retail the encouragement for retail therapy. And I think it's important that we have to pause occasionally and reflect on the climate crisis and need for sustainable retail mm -hmm. therapy and sustainable consumerism as well within that. And it's not for us to assume that people with dementia don't hear any less about that because they have a diagnosis of dementia. So I'd be interested to hear this further research in this area. And my last observation briefly is that the report touches on making the shopping and leisure environments much more accessible to people with dementia. And I really welcome the fact that the remit has extended beyond the shop and into the leisure environments because <coughs> our pubs, our restaurants, our art galleries all have a role to play here in making those environments more dementia friendly. And there's a great opportunity there for people with dementia and their care partners to interact socially and economically and to enjoy spending in these environments and support them. So my final point, which is an opportunity here, is that the report calls for a kind mark for dementia-friendly environments. David, we've done one. We have one, if you would like it. 
Um, this centre is well known for its um, resources around dementia and family environments. Over the past three years, we've been undertaking research and development on environments for ageing and dementia assessment tool. This covers every possible high street environment, from faith buildings to pubs, to post offices to pharmacies, and it provides recommendations on how those environments can be changed. And tier one is free to download. Tier two is about £35 to download, and you can self-certify, and it comes with a window decal. So I hope that that does become a universal kite mark to allow people to recognise these spaces are age and dementia friendly. Because our clients and the people with lived experience that we've spoken to have been asking for some kite mark on a window to recognise that when they go into that space, the environment and the staff provision will support their needs. So I'm a great believer in not reinventing the wheel. There's a lot of competition in this space, and I don't think we need lots of new tools with new environmental assessments, because that just confuses the consumer. So my final point is really a call to ask everybody here and the ILC sure. to recognise and endorse this tool because it is an evidence-based tool and it's the most current one which will cover all environments. So thank you very much for the report um, and we look forward to using these Great. Thanks. Thank you very much. And so it's good to have the check for our research and things that we're doing. But Catherine, let's move on to your comments. So thank Can you. everybody hear me? So I don't need to use the microphone. Um, yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity to um, to comment on this very timely report. And uh, I'd just like to say a few things uh, about what I think are some of the implications for an aging population. And I'd, I'd just like to start out, if I may, by reading a brief account of an incident that happened in 2020. This, I think, uh, is one of the incidents you were referring to, David, uh, that happened in one of America's largest chain stores, Walmart. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that, but they own Asda and actually uh, reflect many of the trends that Lee was talking about this morning in terms of mega shopping environments, anonymous, detached, out of, out of town uh, locations. Um, on June 26, 2020, Karen Garner, a 73-year-old woman with dementia and sensory aphasia, suffered a broken arm, dislocated shoulder, and other injuries while being violently arrested by police in Loveland, Colorado, who had been summoned by Walmart employees after Garner left, left the store without paying for $13.88, that's 12 pounds worth of merchandise. Wal Walmart employees followed Garner outside, took back the items and refused to allow her to pay for them. The employees then called the police because Garner uh, pulled off an employee's fast face mask during this incident. Um, and I'll leave you to read uh, online about further horrendous details uh, of this incident, which, which had a lot of media attention. Ironically, um, Walmart is the, um, the corporation that started uh, hiring uh, older people as official greeters for their stores about 25 years ago. So obviously um, had not caught up in respect to the needs of, of shoppers with um, uh, shoppers with dementia. So that's obviously a very uh, horrific, dramatic example of one of the barriers we're talking about. But it's it, and I haven't seen the report yet, of course. But it's it's replicated in smaller uh, form. Uh, in the UK, I, I came across another report from 2018 with, again, a 78-year-old woman um, in a major supermarket chain in Blackburn uh, became disoriented while trying to pay. And of course, nervousness around making payments and, and paying while shopping was something that was really emphasized in the report. Uh, she was apprehended by a security guard, taken into an office and told that she would be arrested. Uh, the family was ne were never informed. Uh, and <clears throat> what, so of course, it's got a lot of press attention. 
And in an interview about the incident, her daughter explained that all mom needed was a friendly face and a bit of support. So I think that really flags up a lot of points that, that were uh, made uh, throughout today about um, how, how uh, support would go, even small amounts of, of, of the right kind of support would go a long way in, in uh, alleviating some of these um, problems. But the, the report launched uh, today, I think really highlights the fact that people with dementia who want to engage in the very normal and what should be a pleasurable activity of, of shopping face a, a whole raft of barriers in trying to do so that, um, that we heard about today on the typical high street and online. Uh, and so despite the fact that, um, you know, as the Alzheimer's Society, Society uh, report has shown that shopping is um, the most common activity that people with dementia do in their local area, but that uh, a quarter of them had reported that in, in um, the survey had reported that they had reduced or um, uh, stopped shopping uh, due to act, come the kinds of activities that are are, are highlighted in this report. Um, and this has implications for people with dementia, not only uh, to meet their basic needs, but also to engage in what gerontologists have called civic socializing. And, and this is what Frankie's, uh, Frankie's presentation highlighted for us earlier. Um, this concept refers to how older people use interactions in local neighborhood shops as a means of authentication of themselves as individuals and as community members. And uh, the barriers encountered in less local shopping venues where staff aren't familiar with the individual with dementia reduce even further um, the kinds of possibilities for these significant opportunities for social uh, engagement and social inclusion. Uh, the report also makes the important economic case for addressing the needs of consumers with dementia and um, estimates of the spending power of the growing older demographic, uh, the silver market, including those who have or develop dementia, highlights the, the economic potential of this group. One of the key recommendations uh, of the report is to encourage innovation in products and services to support people with dementia. And um, we've heard a bit of uh, today about how the UK's Healthy Aging Challenge is funding research into the development of these uh, innovations, including projects through the ESRC's Social Behavioral and Design Research Program, uh, which Judith directs. Uh, I'm the PI on one of these those projects uh, called GOLD, which is generating uh, older active lives digitally, and it's co-developing digital health promotion tools, including with uh, older people with dementia. Um, so what I see the report is doing is providing a, a really in-depth um, look at issues around the shopping experiences of people with dementia, which are shared, as, as was also mentioned, shared by persons in other disability groups and highlighting the uh, potential for their, for their economic capital in the UK retail sector. Um, there, there were many recommendations, uh, uh, as David pointed out, but for improvements in areas like staff training in retail and leisure settings. These are, um, are supported through initiatives like dementia-friendly communities, but I think this report, what this report will do is really provide um, a major impetus to efforts to support community, uh, consumers with dementia to exercise their shopping rights. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Kathleen. That's great. And we'll pass swiftly on to John, who is our financial expert. 
I will thank you to David and your team for the for important recommendations. I know you weren't really looking for financial services comment, but you got it. It doesn't surprise me because if you think about it, financial services is the golden thread. But it was a bank, but you to ensure that activities and things you can find on. It's a golden thread that links through up just about everything that we do to some extent. Or the people that provide us with services, they uh, those, those, those services. So I welcome the report. Um, the, the compliment the current Public Health Scotland uh, uh, dementia strategy, and also the outside of Scotland uh, pillars, but it also supports the call that's being made in Scotland right now for the, the appointment of a disability commissioner to champion, to challenge every aspect of life in Scotland. So that, the, the, that people with disabilities ability to just live their lives is made far easier than it is today. I would kind of suggest that that uh, commission should be actually be a disability and carers commission as well, because somebody needs to give the carers a, a voice. In the financial services sector, this timing of this report could not be better because we have a one in a, in a 25 year event happening right now, which is a, a complete restructure of retail financial services in the UK with the introduction of the conduct authorities that new consumer duty, which puts an own song all financial service providers to act in customers' best interest and ensure that customers that are that little bit more vulnerable get the same outcomes as everyone else. And it, it, it makes requirements in terms of the set objectives for understanding, for value, uh, for service and support as well. Uh, and that's applies to every financial services company, entity, product and service. I, I hold with the report because I think it's key that we help people live independently as be as active interactive as possible for as long as possible. I think it's also important that, that maybe touched on the, the, some, some of the comments that we made earlier on this morning, we, we adopt a social model of disability, maybe the social model of dementia, um, and everything that, that, that we do, and apply that to uh, the tag, I don't really like the tag vulnerability, but the, the, uh, we extend the social model to vulnerability as well. So we concentrate not just on, on not on the person's medical uh, condition, or, or repairing, but actually, let's, let's basically spend our time thinking about the barriers actually disabled them, the barriers in the way that that that, uh, that cause them to be vulnerable. And I think that speaks to a lot of the architectural pieces that you you mentioned earlier as well as as the uh, the, the the intangible products and services that my industry uh, provides. And when we talk about inclusive, I think it's important that we we we, we focus on being inclusive by design. And when we talk about diversity, that we we talk about we recognize cognitive diversity as well as being being hugely important. But it's important that we champion the experience and, and, and taking the experience to input into everything that we do and co-create solutions. It's important, I think we also support the whole person and all the characteristics to present. I, mean, I see so many initiatives under the label of inclusion and, and diversity that are either focused completely on gender or completely on obesity. Well, there's more, we all, we're more than that. We, we all bring a variety of characteristics into everything that we do. So let's look at all the characteristics that someone presents and, and ensure that when we talk about inclusion and diversity, we also talk about uh, intersectionality and equity uh, as well. And if I was stressed, if we get it right for people with dementia, we get it right for everybody by, by and large. I kind of wanted to focus on two of the, of the recommendations. and and. Let me start with the confidence in, in, in addressing and managing finances. Um, again, they speak to the new consumer duty, and my industry has to react to the recommendations that I made. Um, you know, the, the new consumer duty requires the financial services sector to, to double down on supporting people at moments in terms of vulnerability. We're investing huge amounts of, of money, capital, thought, and energy into supporting vulnerable customers and coming up with all sorts of processes and procedures. Do you know what? The biggest problem we have is we don't know who our vulnerable customers are in the first place. And which is why I think the identification of vulnerable customers is the thing that we really need to think about. But I think we can be innovative. I'm a great believer. I, I really believe in the work that the NHS are doing across the UK with social describing partnerships. We already have a financial services social describing partnership for money and mental health. I think the time has now come to have a social describing partnership from, for dementia and money. Um, so that link workers, social prescribers, no matter what they are, social services, emergency services, GPs practice, uh, uh, practices, 
they can safely and securely identify someone who's vulnerable. And we need a process so they can then alert the financial services provider who can set a markup digital landline, if you like, that Johnny is now vulnerable and needs some support. Here's the thing you need to recognize. When you are paying for the product, financial services products that you, you currently have, you're at part of the premium you're paying is to provide vulnerable customer services. So if you're paying for the service, you should be entitled to the service. And I think that, so that's, that would be a safe mechanism to making sure that people get the right support at the right time and when, uh, when, when they need it. It's important that financial services firms do have dementia specialists, but I, I speak to the three nations dementia group, but one of the biggest problems that they keep popping up all the time is that they, they have to continually repeat themselves it's very difficult to find someone to help them. So we need a mechanism so that people with dementia have a pathway through to the people who can uh, support them and support them appropriately. And in terms of access to banking, a lot of the focus has been access to cash, but just as important as the access to banking services, we've seen banks exit the high street. So we now have the government are now basically putting Link um, in, in charge of deciding should a, a, a town, a village, a location have a banking hub, which would enable people, irrespective of what bank you have, to bank, uh, to deposit money, to to uh, to, to take money out, but equally access simple banking services. Um, it's important that we have, as, we have as many communities that have lost their banks accessing that link service for review, because banking hubs are now here. Um, we have a lot of fin a number of fintechs in the space already. We have a fabulous fintech here in Scotland uh, called One Bank and Denny. Um, they are now putting banking pods in locations around the country to offer people services. So having the ability of someone in the high street that someone can speak to, I think will make a real, a real difference. Um, in terms of the, the, the power of attorney piece that David mentioned, I, mean, it's, it's, I find it astounding that the pension industry and the later life mortgage industry, so that's the mortgage, that's the part of the mortgage industry that enables you to release equity from your house in later life, um, does not insist that people take a lasting powers of attorney before they buy a pension solution or buy a life savings. I think the financial conduct is not easy to, to look at that. Certainly the Office of Public Guardian has now made digital LPAs down over here. You just need to make sure that people are able to, to access the maximum properly. Um, that's probably enough, I think, for really That's great. Thank you for all those ideas, actually. Any concrete actions that we've seen. So thank you, John. Oh, David, thank you, Judith. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you, Judith. Uh, thank you, David, for this report. It's a very welcome, um, uh, very timely post-pandemic. Uh, it's interesting that England may be getting into public policy again. <laughs> um, that'll be an interesting development. Um, but it may be that this will... Uh, Becoming, uh, we'll see in the next week or two in, in, in another period of austerity. I'll come back to that. Um, Johnny, you said uh, you didn't, one big problem is you don't know who's vulnerable, um, which is understandable, sure. Um, I'm uh, uh, quite uh, um, friendly with people who are involved in the health and retirement study in the US which is the granddaddy of the English longitudinal study of ageing or grandparent, sorry, um, of the English longitudinal study of ageing. They've just done, uh, uh, published in the Journal of the American Medical Association four days ago, um, a study using the Harmonized Cognitive Assessment Protocol, which is called HCAP which is looking at the prevalence of, uh, of cognitive impairment in the US and has come to the conclusion, which is not really out of line with other uh, studies that um, amongst those aged over 65, 10% have dementia and 22% of mild cognitive impairment, which kind of means that one in five of your customers yeah. coming into the shop may well have <coughs> cognitive impairment. Um, maybe there's a selection effect going on because I suspect it's a lot less than that. And that's people just deciding, I don't want to go there. Yeah. So a lot of this is about 
getting that proportion up. Um, that's assuming that um, the uh, American prevalences in English um, or British prevalences are, are, are broadly the same. I'll come back to that too. Um, we do know a little bit about aggregate spending patterns of older people. The IFS has done some studies on that. And, and basically finding that people up to the age of 80 are pretty much are level in terms of their uh, average households are level in terms of their average spending. Uh, thereafter, it tends to drop somewhat. Um, the pattern of their spending uh, changes. So there's lots of holidays and service uh, uh, associated with travel in early years of retirement, and then it moves more towards um, a household services, caring, uh, cleaning, uh, that sort of thing. So we know that that's happening. Uh, and I guess there's a, there's a question for the financial services uh, sector is, well, probably we don't want people to be unnecessarily saving uh, during that period. So how do the products fit the likely age profile of, uh, of spending is an interesting topic. It's a little bit above the, the absolutely retail aspect of that, but, but, but uh, there, are, there are certainly um, um, thoughts, uh, 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 I need to think around, around these, uh, these kinds of issues. Um, so, Public policy and costs, I'm an economist, so I think about public policy, I think a lot about costs and how much of this. I think a lot of it can probably be uh, uh, not too uh, expensive. Uh, I've, I've recently uh, run an exercise on what the costs of dementia are in Scotland, or are likely to be, based on the same um, prevalences as a similar study run by people at LIC uh, on England. Basically, we're looking at including the costs of unpaid care, which are huge. I'm happy to talk about that uh, later, but an increase from about 3 billion to 4.5 billion between 2021 and 2045. So a massive uh, increase over that uh, period of time. Um, and these will be distributed differently. There, there, there's always a question about what level of government can make the policies uh, to, uh, uh, that have the most effect here. Uh, are we thinking about national government, Scottish government possibly, UK government? Local government has really been stripped of its, its power to act in, in some ways. Uh, over the last few years, and I suspect that over the next few years, that that situation will be um, will continue. Um, the issue of rural and urban, which Judith mentioned, I think is a, is a big one. Uh, part of the country that I live in, um, uh, I figured out that for someone uh, attending an outpatient uh, appointment at their main hospital, couldn't be done in a day. And public transport. So a 20 minute neighborhood is not really an option uh, for, for some parts of the country. Having said that, my mother was, was treated for dementia uh, two or three years ago. And in the rural event uh, uh, setting, you often get the kind of care which is much more difficult or seems to be much more difficult in the urban setting. So maybe some of the people in the, in the urban settings could learn something uh, uh, from that. Um, so, I say some of it can be relatively inexpensive, uh, but, but there's a, a general, it seems to me, a general need to make people from a relatively young age aware of the challenges, aware of what might be going on in retail environments, aware in all of the environments that we've been talking about. It seems that school can teach quite easily about net zero, but but they can't, they, the, the, the discussion of aging just isn't there. Um, uh, so uh, there are mechanisms within uh, the, the training right throughout the, the um, training journey where there are opportunities which may not cost that much. 
Uh, and then, so that's on people, on infrastructure, well, we'll see what happens. I won't say much about that, that's already been talked about. But as far as technology is concerned, there are huge opportunities with artificial intelligence, it seems to me, to pick up the sort of thing like the lanyards and so on. These should not be, be too difficult to, to um, construct. And of course, they can be rolled out for virtually nothing once, once they are available. So I welcome all of this. Uh, a lot of food for thought. Thank you. Thanks, David. And for order ecosystem. So retail is only one part of, of this, this whole debate. And certainly you would get back into public policy, which is really important. Richard, finally, over to you. Thank you, Judith. Um, so it, it, this is a complete change from, um, from uh, David's perspective on, on things because I've I was reading this, um, this report very much through the experience of having done research recently um, with people with dementia around their experiences of living in a neighborhood setting. Um, and, and from that point of view, this has been really, really interesting to me because I think it kind of fills in a particular aspect of, of what we've been looking at um, in terms of people's day-to-day -day experiences. But I think also the research provides a bit of a, of a context to, to this report. Um, so I just wanted to say a little bit about some of the key findings from, from our study that I think are probably quite, quite relevant to, to what we've heard about today. Um, and then just to, to raise a, a couple of questions, one or two sort of more practical, one or two a bit more um, sort of overarching about, about um, what, what we've been hearing about today in, the, in this, um, on this report. So one of the things that we were learning through, through our research with people with dementia was that enormous changes happening in people's lives when they have, they've had a, a diagnosis of, of dementia. People experience immense social change, so their social networks are shifting all the time. A lot of the people that we spoke to um, experience a loss of contact with friends and with family. Um, some of that was to do with, I think, stigma, but also just a lack of understanding around dementia and a certain degree of um, discomfort and awkwardness. Uh, that people face, but also exclusion from social environments and, and groups that people have previously been, uh, been a part of. We also heard about a changing kind of everyday geography of, of people's lives. So straying too far from home became something that was quite risky. People tended not to do it. And a lot of their lives were lived very much at a local level as a result of that. So the actual scope of people's day-to-day -day lives became a lot more um, uh, approximate to, to, to where they were living. And then one of the challenges that, that this particularly led to was that people um, had real struggles with, with how they filled their time, you know, feeling quite underoccupied in, in, in a lot of ways, but also I think um, wanting ways of engaging with their, with their wider world that was meaningful to them and had some, some kind of purpose. And I think knowing that is quite useful in terms of what we're hearing today because it kind of it's just a, a slight flavour of the significance that retail and shopping can have for people because it's not, not just about buying products, it's very much about a social experience, it's, it's physical exercise, it's getting out of the home when people are often feeling very, uh, uh, very uh, imprisoned sometimes at home, particularly in terms of going out um, at a more independent basis. And having all sorts of other opportunities for participation, citizenship through consumption and, 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 and through continuity in their day-to-day -day lives in a context where there's been a lot of disruption uh, that, people, that people have been facing. So I think understanding the significance of, of what a visit to the shops can actually mean to people is, is, is really important. And we very much actually like, um, like Frankie, we used walking interviews with people. So we put a microphone on them, we took them out into the um, into the neighborhood and they said, well, and we said, take us to places that, that are important to you. Quite a lot of people took us to the shops, they took us to the high street. Uh, that was really interesting because we got to see how people shopped. We saw people shopping practices. In one case, we went to TK Maxx and someone tried on a, a jacket and decided to buy it in the middle of the interview and things like that. So it was, it was interesting because we saw these kind of unrehearsed, impromptu encounters that people were having with shopkeepers and all these kind of different kind of people on the, on the high street. And two things that I'd highlight about that, one was 
the, the importance of seeing things through the lens of mobility. So it's not just about a visit to a particular shop. When you walk around your local um, high street or whatever, you're going to lots of different places and you're having lots of different experiences. And I think what's important about that is that it can be cumulative in terms of the types of encounter that people have and what, what they take away from it. So for example, if you think about a very different kind of, of interaction that will happen with a hairdresser compared to say a corner shop or um, walking into a, into a cafe and spending time sat in a, in a cafe. So there's lots of different things that are actually happening. It's not a single uh, kind of experience for people. And I think also from, from, from that point of view, it kind of underlines the fact that maybe we need to think beyond a single response and start thinking about the variety of what different shops and different services actually um, have, have to offer people. I think one of the things that really struck me about this uh, report was, was the importance of having a focus on, on people with dementia themselves. Because what, what we found in our research was that they're certainly not passively kind of lying back and, and letting these, these situations unfold. They're very active in trying to challenge the loss of social connections, for example, challenge the, 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 the loss of connections to venues within, within their, their community. And we heard some really interesting stories of people standing up to situations where they felt that they'd been excluded or they'd been treated very unfairly. People talked about, for example, using disclosure of their diagnosis as a way of kind of opening up a conversation in a shop or in a library or something like that, just to kind of raise awareness and, and saw this very much as a part of their kind of contribution um, to, to their local community as well. So I think, Putting the person at the centre of this agenda for change is a really important one. Um, but I also wanted to just touch very briefly upon this question that, that, um, about the nature of the changes that we're making, because I, I kind of think that we, we still, there's still a tendency to locate the, the nature of the problem with the person with dementia. And actually, there's a lot of scope for a more collectivised way of addressing some of the challenges that these, this report um, has, has highlighted. Um, an interesting one is the is the slow lane in the supermarket, which I think was in one of the slides earlier on. Um, it's been phased out now. It was used by Sainsbury's for a while and they phased it out, but it, it didn't work because I think it, it segregated people and it separated them out and nobody wanted to be considered to be slow, whether you've got dementia or, or, or not. And I, and I think that points to the importance of thinking about how we're framing the nature of the problem. Um, and how that's leading us to suggest certain kinds of response. And maybe we need to think about things a bit more collectively in terms of, of, of how we're helping people. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So you know, I think it's really important to bring it back to the lived experience of people with dementia. And we've done that really in a great way. So thank you. We're now going to move on to the Q&A session and I've been asked to move close to the table for people online. So I'm not being rude to David or blocking him off. So um, uh, excuse me for doing that. Um, do we have any questions from the floor? Stop, don't be shy. No, I, we've got some questions online. So I'll take those and then perhaps while we're Taking those questions, you can have a think about a few things. Okay. Right. Um, so I'll, I'll read these out as, as they are. So this is from Andrea. Our research also found that access to clean and accessible toilets was important and lack of access restricted where people went. Uh, for example, uh, a carer having to check in advance of a restaurant visit if there were steps, as with parking as was parking near the supermarket. We found that older people preferred to shop in person as it presented opportunities for social interaction and exercise, getting them out of the house. So that's a comment on, on the report from, from Andrea. Um, and then from, from Domini, uh, some of the things being described, for example, too many questions at checkout, overwhelm, et cetera, are issues even without dementia. Is there work being done to simplify things across the board for all shoppers? Good point. Uh, the knock-on effect being that less would need to be added for folk living with dementia. 
Who would like to take that question? Let's see. No, no. I, I think I, I, I would just say, you know, clearly, um, we, we, we need to make the world as simple as possible for all of us. And, and, um, and I think far too often we make it complicated. I just a uh, very, very minor aside. One of them, one of the many things that annoys me, and my colleagues will tell you in lots of them, but one of them, I, you know, someone who's just, I was in Dublin and Berlin last week and it was only used cards. Whenever you now go to buy something abroad, they automatically ask you which currency you want to buy there, which you want to buy there, um, buy the product in. Do you want euros or pound? This, there is no customer benefit at all with this choice. This is entirely about the shopkeeper and the retailer making more money based on hoping you make the wrong choice. Um, and, and this is exactly the thing where we've created and allowed sometimes people to just make the world more complex for us so you could sell us more crap. And just to, you know, perhaps come in on the, uh, your first point about sustainable consumption, where this is, what we really want to do here is push up the idea of consumption as it enhances well-being as opposed to more people buying more plastic crap. And and we think the stuff that Frederick's done, you know, you know it's, it's all about sort of saying, look, actually, let's, you know, make the world simpler for us, you know, but actually within that shopping environment, make sure we're able to access things that really enhance our well-being. David, yeah. What about these Amazon shops, which, where there's no yeah. interaction with a till even? Yeah. I, I think I think that's a really interesting one. The, 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 so this Amazon Fresh, so for those of you who don't know, they're really interesting and they're they're growing. They are really fun. I have to say, they are fun. If you have an Amazon, because and, and I was in there with my daughter and just sort of she was doing things like passing goods back and forward between the two of us to see if we could con the system. And basically, you go in and you literally walk in, scan your Amazon thing, pick up whatever you want to walk out, and there is no engagement at all. Now, for what Amazon do, which I think is really interesting, is they have absolutely, they've replaced the person on the till with two or three people in the shop who will help you, will identify, you know, tell you you can't buy alcohol because you're only 12. They will do all sorts of things that, and I think that, you know, the thing about the the end, the tills point as well that came across really strongly was that actually, you know, for some people using a, you know, as long as it's easy to use, using an automated till makes absolute sense. But let's use the savings you make from that to have someone in the shop who can really help someone. And um, we saw from Lee earlier this morning, one of his, his articles from The Guardian talked about Dixons. You remember Dixons? You know, sort of, you know, one of the things that's happened, of course, is the retailers, and of course the John Lewis News is bad news here as well. The retailers have gone from having people like Dixons where people knew what they were talking about to now you buy a TV from Tesco's and Sainsbury's and you don't have, you're buying a box from the store. And I think there is something about if you're going to automate the till process, just give us someone to stand next to the TV to tell us what the difference between box A and box B is. And I think, you know, we read, I think that would benefit us all, not people with dementia. Yeah. Great. I think, there's, I think there's maybe some lessons that can be taken from what's happening right now in, in financial services because we have... The new consumer duty basically um, requires financial services product providers to remove sludge practices. So this is all the unnecessary steps yes. to try and manipulate someone's yeah. behaviour or change their income, which, which is great to see. Uh, the other thing is, you know, that and it relates to the point that you made, David, about the choice, what was unnecessary. The, the, the regulator is now requiring uh, product manufacturers to actually speak to real consumers. Uh, I mean, there's no such thing as the average consumer. Let's speak to groups of real consumers and just check that the products, the various bells and whistles that are attached to products, they do complicate things. Are they actually delivering any real value? Because if they're not, let's get them out. Yeah. And, and, and it's great to see the, the regulator doing that. And I think, I think some of the things that are, for all the crucial systems we get in financial services, some of the things that are happening now under the umbrella of the new consumer duty, I think, um, offer I think learning for other sectors. Great, thank you. An excellent point. I'm going to pick up uh, two questions from Jeremy Hughes actually, and then come back to some of the other questions on, online here. They're really coming thick and fast here. So if we are in a competition, people better think <laughs> something. <laughs> um, so this is uh, really addressed to Catherine, I think. Um, 
I really like the concept of civic socialization. The extreme example of the opposite is the 500,000 plus people living in care homes. You might not want to think that's different, but anyway, how much of what has been discussed today can be applied in practical actions that enable them to be active consumers? Interesting question. Um, yes, and I, I think um, we just have to conceive of care homes in a way that um, includes them in the community, includes them in the in the larger community. So, whatever kind of practices or policies can help in any way to bring down the walls between. Mm -hmm care homes and, and the larger community. And um, there are, I, mean, I, I know of care home models where um, say shopping, uh, assisted shopping with care home residents uh, who are taken into the community on, on trips um, happens on a regular basis. Uh, and of course with with online shopping, um, that that makes that quite possible too. So um, I think it's more creative thinking about um, about how to do that. Um, you know, shopping as as I mentioned earlier um, is for, for I would think most people uh, thought of as a as a kind of pleasurable activity. Um, I I do a bit of online shopping, but I mean for me, and I grew up at a different time, you know, going into shops was um, was something I really like to do. And um, so I think they're um, the, the kind of mode of shopping uh, that would appeal to care home residents, for example, um, might be interesting to find out, um, and of course would change over time. But I think I think there are ways to conceive of uh, people in care in, in care homes as um, entitled to uh, a retail experience as as much as the rest of us. Thank you, and of course, you know the care market is huge in a sense. It is you know a large chunk. Yeah. You know, it's not just care home residents, but you know. We, Conceptualize it in here, then I think it's different. Yeah. Okay, anybody else want to comment on? No. Well, just to, to make the point that I, th I mean, I think a lot of the conversations we've had today, it, it, it has been an issue about intersections of, of aging and and um, and dementia with questions around class and, and and income. And one of my experiences of working in, in care homes was seeing people who had an allowance of something like 18 pounds a week, and that was everything to cover everything that, that, that they had beyond, beyond their care. So it was often a choice between going to the hairdressers or, um, uh, you know, buying a, a bottle of something or a, a packet of cigarettes. And, and I think we need to, to be a, a lot more cognizant of, of these huge disparities between people with dementia when it comes to, to income and spending power. Um, just, just, just to add, I think you know the only thing I'd add, and we haven't really looked at care homes here, but actually, a care home should be someone's home, and actually, you know, that there was clearly some pretty unfortunate, that's terrible practice during COVID, where people were locked away, and subsequently, um, and I think it's really important that you know that and the the best care homes do this, make sure that people can still to continue to live in the community, and I think we've got to make sure that happens now. Care is in the difficult place, but we have to protect the rights of people to continue to do what they want to do in whatever settings they're living. Yeah, I, I, I yeah. completely hear that, David. I think care of Shelly Street and the local communities. Yeah. Um, I've certainly got experience of that happening in Denmark, you know, where uh, you know, the, there's a progression in care, where you know, care, care in your home, sheltered, sheltered care, and then care in care room settings, but again, in the same community. And there, there is this kind of, that, that does include shopping mm -hmm. trips and being out for country walks and yeah. things like this. It's uh, and I, I think there's a lot we can learn from the, some of the care examples in Scandinavia. And even when you know, students that are, looking, that are studying, you know, rather than spending piles of money on rented accommodation, basically taking rooms with older people. 
and, uh, and that basically helps everybody. It hasn't taken off here in the yeah. UK. It was trying to come yeah. over, but uh, it's a good, good example. We've got a question in the room, so. Yeah, okay. it's more of a comment to add to what you said. So I work for a charitable food training and we support all the people to access food, but living independently in their own homes, many people are housebound. Yet they are still consumers. We now we have people shopping lists and volunteers will go to the shops and shop for them, but obviously they're still engaged in this space. I just kind of thought, you know, we can't forget these people who don't have that physical experience, they also don't have the option to engage online. How can we ensure that we recognize these consumers in this conversation? They're such a forgotten part of society, and it's so easy to forget these people who are socially isolated can't. We do have some people who go to the shops together, you know, they go with a volunteer yeah. and they're able to have that support, but obviously that's one off and it's not consistent and it's sporadic. Um, yeah, does anyone have any talks basically? Yeah. I, I think the, the only thing I'd say is, uh, and I appreciate the point about the online, but I, I think that there might be some simple online solutions that can add some real value. So I have a um, a subscription to a thing, I'm, I'm not advertising it, of course, called Degusta Box, which is a Spanish company that sends you every month a random selection of food worth about £25 for £13. And I, I know today that, that I'm getting a cold box. And I also know that I have uh, a 15 year old child who will be in that cold, that, that thing, taking all of the chocolates and all. Things. And you know, it's quite a fun thing, everyone, because actually, I love the randomness of it. I love getting something. To, and I think there's something that actually, if you can't get to the shops, can you, can we offer people experiences like that that are a bit about, you know, because actually, it's not about the products at all. It's actually, a, oh, I've not seen that before. I've not seen. So, so maybe there are innovations you can do that are, that are online. But you know, um, I, I do, you know, clearly, yeah, yeah, so I, I see everything I say other than I agree, you know, let's find, you know, if we can find other, other interesting and innovative ways of, of letting people have the experience of, you know, of, of, you know retail, but then, then it seems to, you know, it's a good idea. Maybe that's one for George's innovation competition. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Yeah. There are several comments online, and I'm assuming that those comments will be made available to people after the. They're on, the yeah, 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 we can Because um, yeah, yeah. I think that's really important. Some of them are quite yeah. long. So, yeah. yeah. George, were you going to ask? I was sort of going to ask a question. It was sort of prompted by some of the conversation of care homes and things like that. And I just wonder if you looked at this from um, mm -hmm. with a lens of inclusive design. You, would, you begin to differentiate some of the things we've talked about, things that actually are general that are enabling for anyone inclusive of dementia. And you'd look at some things that are exclusive, like wearing a lanyard that says, hey, I'm different. Um, and I just wonder if, if the panel had any thoughts on how retailers might start to navigate what they, you know, where they should put their priority and how they do with, with that lens. Richard, you're nodding. So you're nodding. <laughs> well, I, I'm just to just to agree. I mean, I think it's a really interesting challenge, and 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 I, I mean, I, I refer back to what to what I was saying earlier about taking it away from the person and making it a more um, a, a, a more of a collective situation. Thinking about shopping in spaces rather than individual shoppers, I think is really um, is a really important thing because nobody wants to. Be separated out and I think there's always the risk of stigmatizing someone even if it's really well intentioned like slow lanes and supermarkets and that kind of thing so I think there's a lot of scope for thinking about well what kind of culture or atmosphere have you, have you fostered in, in this shop where people can shop in different paces and different tempos yeah. and yeah. Uh, and perhaps right I think the um so um, in the same way, I, I remember Experian, probably about 15 years ago now, did some work where they showed they could predict um, divorce based on credit cards that spending. <laughs> there is also research from the US that does suggest that you can predict dementia based on bank spending. Now, actually, you know, coming to the point around identifying people, actually there is tech out there that we can start to use to help people get different sorts of experience. I said, mentioned that because actually, 
you know, there is some really interesting high tech stuff in shops that actually allow us to give us different sorts of experiences. And, and some of it's low tech, actually. Some of it's frankly, you know, one of the things that came out of one of the sessions we did was um, a comment for someone saying people like going out in the morning, they like doing eight till 10. You know, actually, what about the retail environment? We're actually stigmatizing people saying, well, let's actually create a slightly different offer for people at eight o'clock to 10 o'clock in the morning because actually they're likely to follow a different profile than someone running in at half past 12 for their boots meal bill. Um, and, and I think there might be something around actually how you could, how you could do that from a, yeah, from a low tech, you know, at, at that point. But actually I've seen some stuff which is slightly scary, but interesting where Elsa will probably know much more than I about it, where retailers can now do differential pricing in shops and things based on you. Maybe you have a, you know, you have, you know, based on who it is, you know, you go in and you might have a device on you and it might think, well, this person can afford. And we know this happens online. This, you know, BA chart will charge me a different price to what it will charge you. Yeah. And, and, and increasingly there is tech that allows you to do that in shops. Now, can we use some of that for social good? Some of the real, you know, we know that you can ping data on people on phones. You know, we can ping information at people. How can we use some of that to say, look, actually you're, you're in this shop, by the way, Boots Next Door are doing a COVID vaccine, hop in there. You know, there are things that we could, can we do, use some of that, and, and we should be able to. Yeah, that's great. We're getting yeah. really innovative and creative yeah. now, so yeah. any other creative yeah. ideas? No, I mean, there's, there's certainly some, there's, again, there's some great tech that's here right now, which is little known about and underutilised. And again, there's a, there's a great Edinburgh fintech called um, mm-hmm. Neatbox, a guy called Gavin Neat uh, uh, runs it. And what Neatbox does, and it was, it basically, it is like a digital passport, if you like. You put your details in, and no matter where you go, what, if, as long as the, the retailer or the, 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 the venue has got, it's called my meet me, it's called meet me. As long as the venue's got meet me capability, it, the minute you enter the premises, it knows if you, and it, it, so it would know, for example, that you actually have a preference for having that seat by the end of the road in the yeah, toilets yeah. and book you that seat. Wow. You know, it, we yeah. know, for example, that, that, that you, you have got dementia. Uh, and so you, know, you could make sure when you get to the tool point, somebody with a dementia friend skill set um, would be the person that would be a good issue. Um, but can, back, back to the point that, that Leslie made actually about you know, the retailers of needing to be aware of a quality act, that they, they certainly do. And I think you also need to bear in mind that core tech duties are anticipatory as well. So if you do hope that's a you're intent, you know, you're expected to, uh, to, to, to use that. Excellent. Lisa, could I just make um, a, a quick comment? Um, Amazon halted uh, plans to expand uh, Amazon Fresh um, in August this year. So uh, they're, not, they're not moving that concept on. Which is interesting because it is, it's yeah. that experience is quite revolutionary. So, um, so that's that's not going any. Further. Is that based on any evidence? Or um, not working. Uh, lack of uh, lack of sales. Oh, okay. so, yeah. I'm gonna um, exercise my prerogative of chair and ask a question as well. We've been talking a lot about um, retailers and and so forth, and it's. I've been thinking, how do we actually incentivize retailers to get into this space and to do something? And it's partly around the business case. You know, we've been talking about social responsibility, civic responsibility, but actually the business case at the end of the day is really important. Um, you know, how do we actually, beyond just saying it's about spending, put things in that business case? For example, um, many of their employees will be living with dementia and working with dementia uh, early on, maybe you know, even further, you know, um, not just mild cognitive impairments. So what other things are in the mix for that business case other than increased footfall, increased spending, your employees might have an issue? Which isn't in the report, actually, yeah. but I'm just wondering, are there things that are missing in the report? A lot of retail um, outlets now will have quite a lot of expertise, given the number of people who've left the care sector to move to retail. 
Yeah, which, which, which could be exploited. Yeah, good point. Any other thoughts on that one? I, I think this is the I think this is actually the big challenge is how how we engage uh, and, and and part of it's the work issue you are going to need you know as you say your your employees will either have direct or indirect um you will start to see dementia being a, a, a bigger issue so so there, is, so there is that um I think what we have at the moment is a small number of really interesting companies who really care and really get it. So you, know, we, you hear a lot about Timpsons who do some amazing stuff, particularly with prisoners, next prisoners. We were talking last night, um, they were telling you about the, the Gre Greg's and the Greg's Foundation, some really interesting innovations. Um, actually, beyond that, you know, it's, it's a really competitive and a really difficult environment. But um, it's really interesting, different space, you know, so, you know, one of our partners, so let me do that, you know, one of our funders, you know, Legal and General, who are, you know, absolutely doing a huge, they're, clearly demography is massive for them. Um, so, and of course, they're investing in lots of buildings. So if I was Sterling, I'd be going and talking to every, every you know, business development that, that Legal and General are funding, because they have a really inter big interest in this, and that includes retail environments. But, but actually, on climate change, they are way ahead of governments. They're way ahead of it. They're actually, you know, legal and general said to us that probably don't know, as a 10, 12 person organization, if you haven't got a net zero policy, we don't contract with you. Government is not going And I think that how do you get the legal and generals and the Patagonias and people like that to really start saying, actually, this is more important than actually whether we make £10 now. It's actually the entire long-term fiscal sustainability of our business model, which is the legal general argument, is that, you know, we don't have investment in 30 or 40 years, at least we don't sort this out. So, and I think it's getting that. Now, how do we get to them is, is what is Ailsa's job for the next 18 months. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I get the it's part of the social responsibility that the businesses have taken on, yeah. the net zero stuff. Yeah. Seems to be no problem. Yeah. Why is this different? And, and just to add, I, you know, one, one thing I'd like to do for the, for the, you know, any funders online or people, you know, wouldn't it be brilliant for us in the same way every FT, at least 250, if not 500, has a, um, an ES, a, a, um, environmental, social, um, um, individual yeah. governance person in. They almost all have diversity and inclusion people. Wouldn't it be brilliant if even the top 100 had a demographer or had, a, you know, someone who could actually say, you know, this is how our marketing change, or this is how our, our customer base will change. This is how, um, you know, we will be selling to different sorts of people. And maybe if we don't have, uh, aim for the top 100, but let's get four or five demographers or gerontologists into companies big companies, your boots and people like that can really, really, really get expertise in. And I think that would make a big difference. And I think there, there's, there is lots of good practice already happening in the sector in respect to people with dementia. I think the issue is that, that old chestnut that it's happening in little pockets and it's not connected up. And but hopefully this report will be a, a spur to get that dialogue going across the sector rather than having these little well, Project that's happens. a very interesting point because we, we, with the International Geography Centre, we recently did a session down in Newcastle, Newcastle University, and we had representatives from local, uh, local business and local government there. And it was very interesting in, in Newcastle that what they did have was someone in local government that was, uh, you know, they made it their business to get into everyone else's business. It doesn't matter if they worked for the council or it was a local firm. You know, they, they, and they were, they were, they made things happen. They were a link person. And I think to some extent, maybe that's what every council should have, you know, in, in, in certain Scotland, but you know, across the UK, something like a, a dementia champion. It brings me back to, if you're going to have a disability commissioner in Scotland, it should, it should be a disability commission, network of commission. You're all anticipating the last question I'm going to ask, but do we have a call? We had a comment or a question. Oh gosh, everyone can yeah. that. No. <laughs> very, very quickly. Um, actually, should we just take all the comments and questions together and then the panel can answer them together? So if you want to start. My name is Liz. I work with Joint Dementia Initiative in Falkirk, the Falkirk Council. Um, I've worked there for 20 years and I work with people who are, we well, talk today about older people with dementia. I work with people who are 55 and, yeah. and younger. Quite, you know, we have a weekly group for people who are 
55 to 60, you know, so I think we need to be thinking about that as well. Yeah. Um, I have a, a lived experience of being with a younger man with dementia when he was challenged in a shop for not knowing his postcode. Um, you know, he was, he's, uh, he's in his 50s and, and that's the real thing. But another thing I wanted to say was we're in the process of starting up a um, dementia-friendly community in a local area. Um, and we're going to be targeting schools and libraries and, and shops and, and we're not quite sure but we're only, it's only going to be a very, very small pilot, like you're saying, it's always small, part is small, um, but just to let people know that that's really good to know. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Thanks. Do you want your yeah, question? Yeah, sure. <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, so one of the things I wanted to add to the discussion about um, how to um, inspire retailers to, to follow dementia-friendly policies, um, nobody's mentioned the organisations that do currently work between the government and retailers, such as the Chamber of Commerce, the Federation of Small Businesses, um, places like Business Gateway. You know, a lot of a lot of retailers, especially the smaller ones, talk to them and, and use them as a the comment. online, actually. Oh, yeah. so, right. <laughs> What's the <laughs> meaning? <laughs> Yeah, but thank you. That's yeah, really yeah. important, and and also the associations around retail as well, like um, mm. you know, small business. Each retailer is usually yeah. a member of one of them. Yeah, yeah. 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 That brings me and, back to the rural Newcastle. Yeah. Newcastle. That was their, that was their job uh -huh. was to get into local businesses yes. and local yeah. business yeah. networks. So I'm going to allow one more comment, and then my question to the panel is, uh, which has also come from online. If they, if you had a magic wand, policy wand actually, what would be the one thing that you would want to really change people living with dementia and retailers who want to reach more people in one sentence? So while you're thinking of that, we'll have the last this is comment. Comment. So yeah, we talked about climate change and we call out people for green shape. Um, but for instance, in my work, um, we see organisations that are named, but they are offering free meals to children, free meals to older people in supermarkets, for instance. Yeah, their staff are treated appallingly, their staff are living in free poverty. There's a major conflict and kind of term it's social washing, this kind of irony that they're portraying this great PR message, but in reality their company's not actually delivering that. And um, I feel like that's maybe an area we do need to not call out, but it's a really opportunity to collaborate. Why are you not leading by example and just publicly portraying this message about being whatever that reason is? And um, I think there's a lot of work to be done in this area around encouraging people to stay in the workforce as well as encouraging customers to come into that space as well. Great, thank you. Right, very quickly, starting at the other end, Richard, one thing. A talk to people with dementia would be my main. Great, David? Put 100 million pounds into training. <laughs> John? I, I would be having my social describing partnership or a, a, a dementia. And vulnerability partnership. Catherine? Yeah. Oh, awareness of raising through training. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And I would train all frontline staff to support people with this behavior and communication due to the yeah. yeah. This is all a great yeah. flag actually for the training that we do at yeah. DSM. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I think I'd add. Um, I think we've made huge progress with increasing the design of products over the last 20 years, but place is getting worse and worse. And my, my rant about hotel rooms and hotels and lighting is just one example of how the built environment, we're just making it much harder when, uh, when we have a lot more people. So let's get place right as well as, as well as actually the products. I can see yeah. another flash coming yeah. up because yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Go on. Yeah. it really answers the question I'm trying to engage. Yeah. Retailers, um, 2017, we launched a product accreditation, and it's great to have Alfred here today. Who I think every flooring that you manufacture now goes yeah. through a product accreditation for dementia friendly. The answer to how do you get retails is you get one because it's commercial and mm -hmm. it's competitive. So therefore you have one and then everybody else will want to buy into it. And the best thing that we have done is working with partners like Altro because it means you can disseminate mm -hmm. the message in a much larger landscape yeah. because everybody with Altro understands, yeah. everybody that they're talking yeah. to understands and the message just gets disseminated. Yeah. So much better. Great. And that's a great point to, to finish on. So can I thank our panel for a great... So thank you very much. Can I now call, uh, while we're swapping around, uh, George McGuinness. Again, I don't think George needs any further introduction, uh, but George is going to uh, talk to us 
uh, uh, the um, the longevity uh, problem. Sorry, longevity. Long, longitude. I always say longevity. It's terrible. So I got longevity on my notes. Um, the UKRI longitude prize on dementia, which is uh, a four point one million pound prize. Uh, to drive the creation of personalized technology-based tools that are created or co-created with people living uh, with the early stages of dementia. So, George, over to you to uh, talk about this. Right. Uh, actually, just before I do, uh, uh, Judith, what, what a great day. Um, David, what a, an amazing report. Shireen, um, you obviously did a huge amount of work for that. Uh, I think it's been, been you know, just a really, really wonderful insight into um, what is actually quite a difficult world. So, um, and for everyone who's asked questions or, or given opinions, thank you very much. Um, so much heralded, and I'm not gonna stand between you and trying to get a cup of tea or, or, or something for too long. He says, as he's just lost his, his slide. Um, long suit prize on dementia. So um, the background, you've already heard a little bit about this. We know that major crisis points in the journey are triggered by um, events um, like um, a decline in independence, losing social interactions uh, and all the rest of it. But as some of the panel have just been sort of alluding to, advances in technology offer potential for really breakthrough solutions. And that's, that's what, what, what we're looking for to maintaining independence. And um, so we've joined forces with the Alzheimer's Society. Um, we've actually just found a little bit of extra money. So it's actually now 4.3 million um, or, 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 the, or thereabouts. Um, I'd actually say that the total value of, of what we're doing is almost double that because there's a whole load of money going into supporting innovators as well. But the, but the prize for applicants uh, or well, the prize fund for applicants is, is as much um, as that. So what are we trying to do? Uh, so the winning solution will be a digital device or a service design, but for use by people living with dementia as the primary users. We, we are very interested actually in people affected by dementia, that is both people living with and their carers and, and, and all the rest of it. But, but we think that that's there. And it must be able to demonstrate a transformational improvement in the lives of users. Um, you'll be able to read what's on the screen. Uh, we think this is AI um, and AI enabled. What's not on the screen is we actually think that the really winning devices must be able to learn from someone, work with them through the progression of the disease. So not just be something that works in one thing, but actually, it learns from, from the progression of the behaviours and delivers that transformational experience. And then um, some examples of, of that essential activities of daily living. Well, we talked a lot about shopping and the role of shopping, but it could be all, all sorts of things. Um, and um, very much a, a, an open prize. What, what I didn't say, so our logo has disappeared from that for some reason. So we've teamed up with the Alzheimer's Society. The actual whole scheme is being run by Nesta's Challenge Works. In fact, um, Alzheimer's Society and us will be the you know, sitting on the programme board as directing it. Uh, but the Longitude Prize um, programme has this grand longitude committee. So it has people like um, Sir Martin Rees, the... the um, Sorry, it's a lord, isn't he? Not even sir. Um, the Astronomer Royal. It has uh, Dame Sally Davis, uh, former Chief Medical Officer in England, now Submaster of Trinity College, Cambridge. There's a whole load of people. So um, really a whole load of expertise to sort of generally look at, is this the breakthrough technology uh, uh, for, for awarding the prize? And then we will have a panel of expert judges advising us in, in, in that independent sort of way. So let me just say a little bit more about what, what we'll do. Um, probably not help there. So, so the essence is a three-stage thing. So we, we're not just sort of throwing it out there and saying, give us your, your final answer. What we're trying to do is firstly build a tent of about, um, the budget says 23 um, sort of people who will apply in the first instance. They will get a small amount of money. Um, I think it's 80K hidden, hidden, hidden by there to do the first stage. That should lead to a sort of proof of concept of what, what you're trying to do. 
there's then another competition to down select that uh, and you'll get that next wave of money. So that's £300,000 to develop a prototype. And the finalists then will be a sort of runoff of whose prototype most impresses um, the judges. I actually quite like that stage design. I, I think it does something particularly for um, you know, environments like our own, where there isn't a huge amount of philanthropic cash knocking around. In the States, the, you know, the, the system's very different. So, so that's what we're doing, aiming to get there in early 2026. A couple of other things that are there. It, it's actually um, open to innovators worldwide. And I know that we've already had... Um, inquiries and interests from quite a broad range of geographies, including um, in, including the Global South, which is which is a really sort of interesting sort of um, development of that. Um, I mentioned the support provided and, and, and there are a couple of key dates. There are some hackathons for people who are interested in applying uh, coming up on, on those dates and they're sort of on the website. And, and final submissions for that first stage is the 26th of January. So it's happening quite fast. I know we've already had quite a lot, lot of coverage. I think I've even heard from someone in the room is very interested in applying already. But um, do please um, visit that website, uh, dementia.longitudeprize, all one word, uh, .org. Um, and uh, that is the prize. That's it. <laughs> I was in Canada last week and they were talking about it in Canada. So it's certainly, it's certainly reaching the global north. As we know. So I think there'll be quite a bit of competition, which would be really interesting. And the slides are available for, the, for those details if you, if you missed them. So. Thank you very much. Well, all it remains is for me to uh, echo George's thanks to you all and to the panel and for all our speakers uh, as well. And for some great questions, both in the, from the room and online, actually. And uh, unfortunately, we couldn't ask all the ones uh, online, but um, hopefully you dip into the recording uh, afterwards and, and have a look at the chat and some of the things that were, were asked. The full report of the ILC uh, is actually uh, available online and everyone who's attended today uh, will be sent a link to the, the follow-up follow and a follow-up email. Um, the ILC's Future of Aging conference is coming up on the 24th of November and it does feature a session um, on uh, the future of dementia. I'd also like to plug the Healthy Aging Challenge conference, which will be November the 5th. Uh, in London, in person at the Oval, or is it available online? And it's available and, online. And, available and online. it's free. And it's free. So what more do you want? It's a, an abundance of information, networking, which is so important these days. Um, so please, uh, both conferences will be fantastic. I know I've been to both of them before and uh, they're annual events and they're really tremendous, really great. You can tell it's the end of the day, I'm losing my voice. Um, so... All I wanted to know is to really thank you so much and to commiserate with people online because we've got team coffee outside. You'll have to make your own if you're online, but we've got some uh, nice, I think, nice cakes as well outside. So can I invite you all uh, to join us to have further discussions, networking um, outside with a cup of tea or coffee. And thank you, everyone, for a super day, super report. Thank you, David, and everyone at ILC. It's been wonderful working with you, actually. And uh, let's hope that AOS's work will have huge traction and we can really make an impact in the retail sector because I think, you know, the time has come where we need sectors, not just the retail sector, but particularly the retail sector, because shopping and retail is something that we all enjoy. We're all thinking about our future and there's huge opportunity, as you said, here. So thank you very much for introducing us to, to this topic. But thank you. Thank you all.